Welcome. I'm Thorsten Beck. I'm uh, one of uh, three organizers of the second London Politics and Finance uh, Conference um, called London, not because uh, we are all based in uh, London. Uh, the conference doesn't really take place in London. Of course, it's virtual. But uh, both uh, Orkun and I uh, and Paolo, our third uh, co-organizer, are based in London. And of course, we had very good intentions uh, like a year and a half ago to actually organize this in London. Unfortunately, for the second uh, year in a row, uh, we have to do it virtual. But that doesn't uh, prevent us from having uh, uh, very interesting papers and uh, having very lively discussions and conversations, I think. Um, and um, I'm not going through to the logistics because uh, uh, Orkun is much better place to do that because uh, he's done 99% uh, of the work uh, that was distributed between Paolo, um, him and me. Um, but of course, I'd like to thank the, uh, uh, all of our colleagues at the LSE who have uh, kind of uh, done the, all the administrative and logistical work uh, behind it. But again, Orkun will uh, uh, discuss this uh, in more detail. Orkin, over to you. But first of all, again, welcome everybody and very much looking forward to, to these two afternoons ahead of us. Thanks. Thank you very much, Thorsten. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that you uh, welcome my contribution. I also quite uh, appreciate uh, your feedback and guidance throughout the whole process. Uh, so hello, everyone, friends and colleagues uh, all over the world. For those of you who may not know me, I am Orkun Saka from University of Sussex and the Systemic Risk Center at LSE. We are incredibly happy and excited to welcome you in this second edition of our London Political Finance Workshop, uh, which we call shortly for uh, POLFIN. As always, we are supported and very grateful to those two institutions that Thorsen just mentioned, who supported us both in the first and the second editions uh, now, namely the Business School, formerly CAS, at the City University of London, and the Systemic Risk Center at LSE. In particular today, we are uh, being helped uh, immensely uh, in the technical issues, especially bringing this uh, conference to you over this uh, Zoom platform by Oana Tudoren and Lowe uh, and Lucas Brandel Chang from Systemic Risk Center at LSE. So we really appreciate uh, their, their time uh, and help. And our further appreciation goes to our co-sponsors who helped us distribute the event in their networks. Uh, namely Center for Economic Policy Research, CPR, and the Financial Markets Group at LSE. Of course, when deciding on the final set of papers, we ended up selecting eight papers. We wanted to actually add more, but we didn't have enough space. In total, we received almost 100 papers, uh, which was uh, quite a bit of an inc increase, actually, compared to the first version of the workshop. Uh, in the first version, we were something around like 60s, 70s, uh, uh, of course, increasing numbers both, I think, show us that the, the, the workshop is becoming popular, but also I think the, the topics that we are covering through this workshop are becoming more and more popular, both in the, in the, uh, in the field of uh, politics and also in the field of uh, finance. So while we were selecting the papers, we benefited greatly from the detailed evaluations of our scientific committee who deserves uh, our appreciation by their name. So that's uh, the Anna Tadmati, Matilda Bombardini, Jeffrey Schwerot, Sean Cole, John Danielson, Ralph De Haas, Sardar Dinch, Barry Eichengreen, Paula Giuliano, Sergei Guriev, Simon Johnson, Elizabeth Kempf, Kelly Shu, Dimitri Rianos, and Luigi Zingales, and some of whom actually will be with us during uh, today and tomorrow sessions uh, on and off, and hope uh, they will uh, also uh, help us and enrich our discussions by, by directly participate, participating with their questions and comments. So despite the rigorous process that the papers have gone through to be selected, of course, we are aware that there have been many excellent papers who, who we would individually very much like to, to, to include, but uh, we couldn't give space. And we, our hope is, again, just like last year, is that hope, hopefully those authors will still uh, keep up with us and uh, continue submitting uh, their work uh, to this workshop in the coming editions. So that's uh, from my side. Thanks a lot again, of course, uh, probably the biggest thanks goes to our uh, presenters and discussants who, who uh, very, very uh, thankfully uh, are sparing their time, uh, even though we, we are giving very brief, uh, maybe intervals for them to, to speak, uh, but we appreciate uh, all the time that's being spared. So uh, before we start uh, with the first session that I will be chairing, uh, there, there, there are a couple of 
housing housekeeping uh, rules that I need to clarify with you, uh, both for the panelists and, and for the uh, audience. So first of all, I need to tell you that the event will be recorded and then our plan is to post the event uh, over YouTube and it will be available uh, subject to, of course, uh, the consent of the presenters and uh, discussants. Uh, it will be available on the event webpage. That's the webpage where you actually found your re registration, uh, the same webpage of the Systemic Risk Center. And in terms of papers, we have allocated one hour for each paper. And within that one hour, we are going to se separate uh, it to 30 minutes of presentation. And in that 30 minutes, we are actually expecting to have a smooth presentation. So hopefully we will interfere with the, with the speaker while the paper is being presented uh, quite minimally, only if there is a very urgent uh, uh, clarification question. That's when we intend to uh, uh, intervene. Other than that, we will uh, you know, uh, discuss the, the, uh, the bigger questions in the Q&A session. So 30 minutes presentation, 10 minutes for the discussant, just following after the presentation, and then 10 minutes, uh, the Q&A session where we can discuss uh, the questions. And then hopefully, if, of course, this depends, we are gonna try to be flexible. We are sparing 10 minutes for the, lap, uh, for the, for the break just before the next paper. But of course, depending on the intensity of discussions, that, uh, that interval may you know, be longer or shorter. We will we'll see about that. But hopefully we will start for every paper in the, in the beginning of the R. So if you're in the panelist uh, section of the event, uh, I would like to remind you about two things. So first is please remain muted because you have the option of being, you know, uh, unmuting yourself uh, without or uh, control. Uh, so try to minimize the background noise uh, as much as possible, please. And if you are, uh, if you want to ask a question through written form, please use the chat uh, box that you see underneath on the Zoom platform. Uh, the Q&A is actually disabled for you, but when you are using the chat button, please make sure that it's targeted. Everything is targeted towards uh, both panelists and attendees to make sure that you know all the discussion is visible to everyone, so that we don't have maybe two parallel discussions. Okay. Uh, and if you're an attendee, uh, again, please ask all of your questions through the Q&A box, uh, which is available to you. Only if you have a technical question, please raise that through the through the chat box. I hope uh, all the rules are clear. I guess a short version of these rules might also be posted later on on the on the chat box. So, without further ado, I would like to uh, start with the with the first session, uh, and I think we are almost exactly on time. So, uh, my time uh, seems to be in the beginning of the hour. So uh, with, the, with the first session, we are going to look at the politics of corporate favoritism, and we are going to start with the first paper on the power, scrutiny, and congressmen's favoritism for friends firms. And it's going to be Q Trang Nguyen from Northwestern University, who will be presenting uh, her co-authored work. So uh, Trang, would you like to share your screen? Definitely. Okay, so just want to make sure that everybody see my screen up here. Mm -hmm. Great, thank, thanks, Q. Thanks a lot, Okun, for the introductions, and thanks to Thorsten, Okun, and all the organizers for all the hard work. Um, I'm Gil Chang Nguyen from Northwestern University, and I'm very, very excited to be kicking off the workshop with our work today on power, scrutiny, and favoritism. This is a joint work with Kuo Do, also from Northwestern University, Yen Tech from National University of Singapore and uh, Bang Nguyen from Cambridge University. And all my co-authors are also on the panel today. They'll be very happy to be answering questions. So if you do have any questions while I'm presenting, uh, please do send them their way. Okay. And so the political scientist Harold Laswell has said since 1936 that politics is all about who gets what, when and how. This suggests that favoritism is a key phenomenon in politics and is very closely related to political power. And on the topic of political power, Lord Baron Acton has famously said, power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And from this quote, it's often get taken for granted that higher power begets worse corruption and worse favoritism. However, what is not really clear is that whether we should expect this relationship in equilibrium when the institutions can be designed to provide checks and balances to curb corruptions at the higher level. And the following quote, 
commonly attributed to John Adams, highlights such equilibrium considerations. Because power corrupts, society demands for moral authority and character increased as the importance of the position increases. And so this motivates our research question. Does more power always lead to more or maybe less favoritism? John Adams' quote suggests that higher office may entail stronger scrutiny and in a well-functioning democracy such as the US, stronger scrutiny makes election more sensitive to favoritism, which curbs the incentive for favoritism. And so favoritism is actually governed by two opposing effects. And if the effect of increase in scrutiny actually dominates the effect of higher power, then it might be the case that favoritism could diminish as the politician attains higher office. And we focus on a specific empirical topic that is about favoritism towards friends firms by US congressmen. And why congressmen? Because they're important. They present the topic that has received the most attention in research on distributed politics. This literature has highlighted how powerful and how influential the Congress seats could be, especially in giving out favors. However, uh, this literature has mostly emphasized the power of the congressman, sometimes measured by seniority or by committee membership, without a lot of consideration for scrutiny. And second, instead of looking at perks, no, the type of pork barrels targeted as constituency and the type of political quid pro quo relationship, we instead consider friendships, um, social connections defined among former university classmates. Um, this type of predetermined relationship, which has been pioneered by uh, Lauren co-authors in their work, has been shown you know, to be important in the corporate world. And so this is our game plan. This chart captures how we identify the effect of higher office on firm value using close elections. Now consider two candidates, Congressman E, and defeated candidate D, who are connected to firms A and B through their former classmate M and N, who are now sitting on the boards of the firms. Around the date of the election, we measure how the stocks of firms A and firm B react to the election news. And in relation discontinuity design, as the vote margin between these two candidates approaches zero, comparing the elected congressman E and the defeated candidate D becomes equivalent to comparing two randomized draws as the characteristics of these two candidates, both the observables and the unobservables become perfectly balanced in expectations. And this produces a near randomized natural experiment that allows us to estimate the causal effect of being connected to congressmen on the firm's market value. And let me give you a quick preview of our findings. We find that the firms connected to the elected congressmen on average lose 2.8% of market value compared to those connected to the defeated candidates, which is consistent with the view that school TD in Congress is generally much higher than in state politics, where corruption is likely to be more rampant. And consistent with that, we find that this adverse effect is magnified when the scrutiny gap from state politics to Congress is deepened. We also find that this effect is stronger in the earlier part of the politician's career, consistent with um, the idea that career concern is more um, uh, is more important to the politicians during this time. It's also affected by the politician's power to keep favored and also on the firm's capacity to receive it. And finally, we also provide evidence that this effect is not driven purely by homophily, but the other type of um, channels in which the politicians put additional pressure on the firms to increase uh, employment beyond the optimal level and thereby affecting the firm's performance and the market value. So our paper builds on a very large literature on favoritism towards firms. Many of you here have contributed to this literature, both in the US or elsewhere. I'm not going to um, do a deep review of this, but I want to highlight that this literature has mostly focuses on the monotonic relationship between power and favoritism, with very few exceptions. On the, on the other hand, our paper highlights a more novel and nuanced pattern of favoritism that is dependent on both power and scrutiny, with the effect being very cleanly um, estimated in the regression discontinuity design. So in the remainder of the talk, I will quickly go through a conceptual framework that's mostly useful for us to put together um, to frame our empirical results. Then I talk about our data and methodology, I will describe the results and conclude. 
So we organize our thoughts in a dynamic model of favoritisms and political career. And I want to highlight the settings of two different positions in the Congress and outside of Congress, which for simplicity, uh, we call state politics. And the object of our empirical exercise is the differential value of the connection to the firm as the politician moves between those, um, these two different offices. And we call that Delta V. In our model, the politician chooses uh, the amount of favor to be given out to the firm. And that will be shared between the firm and the politician. The larger the amount of favor being given out, the lower the chance of election success. And so the two important parameters in our model will be beta, which is the relative power to give favor between the Congress and state politics, and gamma, which is the relative scrutiny level also between Congress and state politics. And you can interpret that as a sensitivity of re-election to favoritism. And our model gives us two results. The first one is that when power, um, when scrutiny, Trump's power, relative scrutiny is actually larger than relative power, then it could be the case that hired office could actually have an adverse effect on favoritism. And this one is stronger in the earlier part of the politician's career. The intuitions is that earlier in the career, career concerns matter a lot more to the politicians. And so scrutiny is more powerful in curbing favoritism in Congress politics compared to state politics. Later on, it's no longer the case. And at the extreme, at the very last period, you would imagine that the politician no longer care about re-election and therefore would choose to give out the maximal amount of favoritism. Our second proposition describes the different factors that affect the magnitude of this first effect on high, uh, of high office on favoritism. And intuitively, this differential value widens as the scrutiny gap widens, and it's also widens as the power gap Titans. Moreover, it would be a little bit less intuitive is that when this gap, when these ratios are the same, um, the adverse effect of higher office is also larger when there is a higher degree of a power to give and a lower absolute degree of scrutiny. Now, in order to bring these predictions to the data, we first identified all of the closed Congress elections during 2000 and 2008, and we followed the literature in defining uh, the closed elections as those having uh, below 5% of vote margin between the winner and the runner up. And starting from that sample, we had collected biographical information for all the politicians involved in these closed elections, both for the winners and much more challenging for the losers. For the directors, we get the data from Bordex, uh, which many of you here have used and are familiar with, which provide very detailed information on biographical education and employment history of our directors of major US public firms. And then we're following the work of Lauren co-authors in identifying connections between uh, as a classmate network. And here specifically, a politician and a director are considered to be connected if they finish the same university in the same program within one year of each other. And as I show later on, we also vary these definitions by allowing them to have a, a lower model overlap. And we do find some interesting results that I will describe later on. So this gives us a final baseline sample of 126 closed elections during this period, which is close to the universe of all closed elections. Um, they are associated with 170 politicians who are connected to more than a thousand directors and firms through more than 100 different uh, institutions. Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, we employ a regression discontinuity design of closed elections. So our observations unit is a politician and the directors at a certain firm in an election year. If we use different unit of observations by collapsing the data differently, we get essentially the same results. Our main outcome variable of interest is the firm's cumulative abnormal returns within the one quick period from the day minus one to day five, with day zero being the election date. And our main explanatory variable, the treatment that we're interested in is winner, which is an indicator of whether the connected politician P wins the election in that year. And as standard is an RDD, uh, we control for polynomials of the running variable, which is the vote share separately on each side of the 15% cutoff threshold. So in a regression discontinuity design, 
when the candidates cannot precisely control the outcome of the elections, then this treatment variable winner is as good as random at the cutoff. There's been a little debate in the political science literature of whether these assumptions of no full manipulation actually hold in the context of US politics. However, the latest results coming out of that debate, as summarized by De La Costa in EMI, is that we have a lot of reasons to believe that the, um, the assumption, the key assumption of RDD is valid in the setting of US congressional elections. So in that setting, then the each characteristic of um, the involved politicians, both observed and unobserved, would have identical distributions on either side of the cutoff, conditioning controlling for the running variable. And that allows us to interpret beta as the causal difference in firm value between winner connected and loser connected firms. And indeed, we find that uh, all the predetermined characteristics of the politicians, the directors, the firms, and the states in our baseline sample are balanced at the 50% cutoff. So this is a long laundry list of the things that we check for. And out of the 49 different uh, variables, only three are statistically different at the cutoff, which is no more frequent than what we should expect to happen by chance. And now let me move on to the results. So this graph visually summarizes our key finding in the paper. It plots the market reactions to the values of the firms connected to the winners and the losers at the 15% of vote share threshold, both before and after the elections. And you'll see in panel A that before the election, so in the week that leading to the election, there's absolutely no difference between those two sets of firms. And after the elections, the firms that are connected to the winning candidate actually experience a huge drop in market value that is statistically significant compared to the firm that are actually connected to the difficult candidates. And this is um, the same set of results in regression format uh, where you actually can see the magnitude. So as before, again, before the elections, there is no difference between the two sets of firm. The effect appears only after the elections. And within the first day, the firms that are connected to the winners actually experience a 1.6% drop in market value. And the market continued to adjust in the few days after that for a total soil effect of 2.8% within the one week between day minus one and day five. And so for the median firm, this effect amounts to a loss of $18 million, which is equivalent to the value of three patents. We also find that this effect is robust to a wide range of alternative specifications, including using different levels of uh, different polynomial controls or using robust uh, bandwidth, optimal bandwidth selections, additional controls and fixed effects, and so on and so forth. And importantly, when actually put in additional controls and fixed effects, the result remains the same quantitatively, which further uh, lend validity um, to our RDD design. So on average, we do find that firms lose 2.8% uh, when they are connected to the winning candidate, suggesting that on average, greater scrutiny dominates greater power. Now we move on to um, explore the two different uh, channels that are play here, scrutiny and power. And we first show evidence of our key uh, assumption that scrutiny increases when one moves to Congress. And so this shows the change in media mentions for the politicians in the year after the elections compared to the year before the elections. And Meda mentioned here is actually measured as the numbers of times that the name of the politicians appear in a local newspaper after being normalized for neutral keywords for separate groups of politicians. And we find that the winners actually experience an increase in media mentions while all the losers experience a decrease. More interestingly, the increase in media mentions among the winners are all driven by the challengers who are now moving into office. And the decrease among the losers symmetrically are driven by the incumbents moving out of offices. And so given that, let's examine the predictions regarding how the adverse effect depends on scrutiny. Here you see four different graphs. Each of them plots how the coefficient of interest, the value of being connected to congressmen, varies with different proxies for state level scrutiny. And consistent with the proposition two, we find that this adverse effect is large in magnitude when there is a low level of voters' political interest in the state. 
or when voters in the state have a limited exposure to media, especially the type of media that cover election news, or when in the states there is low voter turnout for state level elections relative to their interest in federal elections. And similarly, when we use another proxy for so state level scrutiny that is more of an outcome based, this is based on corruption, we also find the same pattern that the magnitude of the adverse effect is larger when the state is more corrupted. This is a similar graph that shows how the effect or the adverse effects of being connected to the winning candidate varies over the politician's career. And we're focusing on the challenges uh, in, um, um, with the implicit assumptions that the power that they will receive when they become a newcomer in Congress will be quite similar among them, regardless of their age. And very um, consistent with the prediction from Proposition 1, we find that the younger positions with likely stronger career concerns also produce a much larger adverse effects when they are mostly moved to Congress on the, market, uh, on, the firms, uh, on the market value of the firms. And that disappear over time as they progress in their career. Now, let's just move on to explore how this adverse effect actually depends on the politician's power to get favor. First, as the power gap is smaller for challengers, there will be newcomer to Congress. We find stronger effect among them versus the incumbent. Instead, among the, no, in, 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 among the incumbents, you see that the effect is not statistically different from zero. We also compare the different politician backgrounds using their prior experience as a proxy for their power. And we find that the, this adverse effect is strongest among those coming directly from state politics, as they are the one who have the least power in Congress to give favor if they get elected, but they already have a lot of power in the state. On the other hand, as the politicians become more entrenched in Congress, among those who have some uh, house experience or some Senate experience, we see that this effect actually, this adverse effect becomes smaller. And at this spectrum, among the incumbent senators, this effect is even positive. In fact, among this subsample, power now trumps scrutiny. Even though this result should be taken with the grain of salt because we have a very small subsample of um, incumbent senators, there are not many incumbent senators actually experience a close election. And related to power, firm characteristics are also another set of determinants uh, of how much favor that the firm can enjoy from the connected politicians. We imagine that the smaller local firms or mostly operate in the state probably will benefit more from um, state level type of favor, while the very large firms uh, with national scope operations are more likely to benefit from um, federal level favor. And so using market value as a proxy for the scope of operation of the firms, we do find that the adverse effects are elevated, they have become smaller as the firms are larger. And in fact, among a sample of really large firms um, who are most likely to be natural firms, so these are the firms whose market value are above the median of the S&P 500 firms, um, we actually see a positive effect of being connected to congressmen. Among the smaller firms, especially local firms, defining as those having the headquarter in this focal state or close to the state. This adverse effect of being connected to congressmen are the largest. Separately, we'll now see that state level regulations also create opportunities to give our favor at the state level. And so we would expect that the higher number of state regulations, um, the adverse effect will be strengthened. And here we're using a, re um, a regulation index that is based on 1990 data right before our study period. And we do see that among all the firms in the samples, the first effect are stronger in the firms with higher level of regulation. And this one is even strengthened among the local firms who are most likely uh, to benefit from state level regulations. Okay. We also find a set of additional results in support of our predictions. So talking about beta, the power to give, it also depends on the capacity of the firms to receive favors in how would the firms are utilizing their relationship in order to uh, make the best out of their connections. And so we expect this effect is stronger, the first effect to be stronger among the better governed firms as measured by their bot size, 
or the share of uh, institutional uh, holders. And we do see that the adverse effects are the largest among firms with smaller board not likely to have better connections, and also among the firms with the large share of institutional holders. The magnitude of the effects also increases with the strength of the relationships, how close are the directors is to the politicians. And we have different proxy to measure for this, as measure that the level of trust between the directors and the politicians uh, at the state that they are um, working together with, or whether they have just uh, went through a recent unions. We actually see that this adverse effect is the strongest when um, the, the share institutions of the director and the politician just have the reunion in the year before the elections. And also whether the numbers of overlapping years, the time they actually share during college. So in our baseline definition, we define them to be um, connected. If they actually uh, graduate within one year of each other, so we mean they're very close. If we actually relax the definitions to being two, three, or you know, further apart, or in the alumni network, we actually the, see that this adverse effect actually decreases as we relax the definitions. And when we consider the alumni network, it actually completely disappears. And that exercise actually also allow us to provide evidence against homophily. The fact that politicians and directors may just go to the same school because they care about the same thing or they have the same type of preference that lead to um, their um, goal. You know, so favoritism is driven by shared, um, shared preference instead of the fact that um, it's really uh, because of social connections. And how is it that we can interpret this as evidence against homophily? Because if homophily really matters, then we would imagine that connected alumni firms will also enjoy similar benefits from the politicians. But instead, we find that this is actually very narrowly targeted toward the classmate firms only. So here, we construct the same sample, but allowing connections to be based on alumni network. However, we actually separate out the effect of those being connected through classmate and those who are just connected through the alumni network. And we have various definition or various way to define the alumni network. But across all of these definitions, we find that it's really the ones that are connected to the classmate that are benefiting or sort of experiencing um, this adverse effect when being connected. And we do not see the same effect among the alumni one. So it's really narrow targeted. We also look at the long-term effect on firms' uh, outcome other than market value. And we find that firms that are connected to the congressmen actually reduce their activities in the state as measured by the, the number of times that the, the firms are mentioned in local newspaper. And furthermore, we find that the directors that are driving these connections also are more likely to leave the firm earlier once the connection is being con uh, elected to Congress. And finally, we may worry that whether investors really know information about classmate networks, are these type of information really selling in the market? And in fact, not all investors need to know about the relationship between politicians and directors. If there are enough investors know about such relationship, it may already trigger an information cascade that produces the observed market reactions that we report in our paper. And in fact, we find that connected firms to both the winners and the losers actually have an increase in the abnormal trading uh, volume uh, during the time period leading up to the election, suggesting that those firms are really in the investor focus uh, around the Thai elections time. So in conclusion, our paper shows that when politicians are elected to Congress, their connected firms receive less favor than if they are not on average. We also shows that what determines the drop in values are based on the scrutiny level of the state by both voters and media, and also depends on the characteristics of the firm and the politician in question. So this finding highlights the role of scrutiny, especially those that are based on media's and voters' attentions in shaping favoritism in politics. And this can be important in the design institutions and scrutiny, for example, for topics such as the allocations of resources to media. And thank you very much for listening.
thank you very much, uh, Trank. This was uh, amazing, actually. Your four minutes early, even that's like the a, a chair's dream, I guess. Uh, you, uh, <laughs> not having to warn you in advance, so that's uh, very much appreciated. So, without taking too much yeah, time, you. I'm going to turn to your discussant. So, we are going to have uh, Lauren Cohen from Harvard University to discuss uh, this paper. Lauren, uh, you may want to share your slides. Yeah, we can see them now, um, but we cannot hear you yet. All right, all right, there we go. We got it? Yeah, yeah, now we can hear you, great. Uh, very nice. Just to remind you again, uh, 10 right. minutes uh, or so you have, but you can take a few more minutes, I guess, like now that we are a bit more flexible. No, no, I'll keep it tight, I'll keep it tight. All right, uh, thanks so much. And thank you for asking me to discuss this paper. Um, and so look, um, I think that, um, look, this is the nice part about this paper is that it's um, a simple and powerful idea. And I think that, um, that Trang did a beautiful job of, of presenting it. And so I'm not gonna go over any of the results that she mentioned because she made it so clear, right? And so I just wanna say this, I think that uh, it, this paper in a broad sense, it brings really, in an intriguing look and, and perhaps a counter perspective. And I wanna talk about that um, to much of the literature on connections of political agents and the value of those connections to firms. But I wanna draw your attention to these three results that you mentioned, okay? First, um, the paper posits that there's a trade-off between this uh, ascending power, right? More benefit for connected firms and the increased scrutiny that comes from that higher position, right? Not just power. Um, and that that hasn't really been properly dealt with in the literature, okay? So they're saying, hey, look, we kind of understood this, but we didn't take it seriously enough. Um, and they then go on to provide empirical evidence that politicians who win elections induce a loss in value to connected firms due to overpowering of the increased scrutiny. In particular, they do that by using the identification of close elections, okay? And so these last two empirical pieces, look, they're the heart of the paper in the sense that we kind of knew there was a trade-off before. And so the paper doesn't claim to be a huge theoretical contribution, but it's more on the empirical side. And so I'll focus on that because I think that's really the burden of proof on the paper in terms of really moving this conversation forward. And so I'm gonna focus on just two points from the paper. And they are, um, first, why do prices go down, right? And that's largely moving our prior. So I wanna kind of give you my prior, where that prior comes from, where the literature's prior is, what the paper has done and what it really hasn't done, right? What I think it needs to do moving forward to convince us of this. So first, look, I understand the paper's main proposed trade-offs, but I, even after reading the paper, I had a difficult time getting comfortable with this idea, right? Because in order to get comfortable with the idea, and I just wanna say it out loud, we have to believe that, the, that price drops are cause, cause, if we believe the identification, by a candidate winning a close election as opposed to the only other outcome is by moral situation, and that's they lose. So we say, hey, look, the candidate won, and that causes the prices of connected firms to drop. Again, the fundamental belief that all readers will likely have um, and be comfortable with is that on average, a political campaign loser has a career that in net accrues um, here, sorry, a lower expected value for connected firms, right? And the political winner has a career that accrues a higher expected value. Right. In a close election, what should be priced in current valuations leading up, right, leading right up to that second of the election? Well, it's that roughly 50-50 valuation we have of that bimodal distribution, so the expected value of both those outcomes of the win losses. And given that the favored candidate ends up winning, it seems reasonable for us to start with that prior. And we have some evidence um, that it's a better for us as the connected firm if our person wins, right, our candidate wins. So that's the prior that most of us start with and why the paper and what that paper kind of needs to get over, right? Why the paper says, hey, we're contributing literature. We want to change that prior. So look, um, there's just a lot out there that forms this prior. We didn't get it randomly, right? Um, we, there's evidence from the literature, from lots of literatures, political science, finance, economics, that connections to more powerful politicians are more valuable ex post. Right? Not only are they more valuable ex post, firms pay more for them, they try to get them, but secondly, that 
connections to winning politicians are more valuable which is to say that in specifications that have been run in the past in papers, um, they find the opposite to be true, but using the whole sample. To be fair to this paper, not just using close elections, but using the whole sample. Um, we see firms paying more for these connections, right? In terms of lobbying dollars, in terms of PAC contributions, lots of other things, and they pay them more often from a frequency standpoint. Um, and in particular, they contribute to re-election campaigns, right? The exact thing that the paper is saying is reducing value to that firm, i.e. getting to that higher position. And so given all these, um, it's not that the paper can't be right, right? The paper for sure could be right. It's just that the, they need to do more to show us why the past literature is so wrong, right? What in what the past literature has done has biased the estimate so much? Why are firms paying so much more when they're doing this thing that damages the next post, right? Um, and so here is part of the argument that's given in the paper. And I just wanna read this because it's so important. Um, they say that, look, this adverse effect of higher position on favoritism means that connected firms benefit even more from defeated candidates, okay? Even more, from your candidate loses. Your candidate loses, you should be high-fiving. Oh yeah, our connected candidate just lost. This is awesome for us. Um, and mostly state level politicians than congressmen. In a comparison study, they mentioned the study, we find corroborative evidence that closely elected governors of US states add 4.1% to the market value of their former classmates firms. This fact complements the paper's message that key positions in state politics can generate stronger favoritism toward connected firms than Congress seats. Now that could be totally true, but it still seems like a somewhat modest and, and really indirect piece of evidence for this mechanism, which is to say, even if it were true, it doesn't mean that losing a congressional election helps propel one's state level electoral and political prospects going forward. So one of the suggestions I have for the paper is just kind of show that's true. If it's true in the data, that's awesome, but we need to see more than like, hey, it turns out if you lose, that's awesome. Here's why it's awesome, because governors, when they win, they add value. You need to show that these fallen angels from these lost elections at the Senate are more likely to get a gubernatorial seat or a state Senate seat, or they do more in state elections in order to say, hey, this is why. It's not only that you lose, you can't stop there. It's that losing must somehow increase your chances and increase your power at the state level. And the paper has yet to do that, okay? And in fact, political science literature up to this point, and again, the paper has more to do to show why it's wrong, has shown the opposite, which is losing any election actually has negative consequences on, action, on, on your future political career on average. So the paper needs to do significantly more on the empirical side to show us, hey, that's not the case for these close elections. And in particular, that's not the case for these close elections in the mechanism that we propose, which is you lose a close election, that's awesome news for your firms because then what you do is you go to the state level, you win a ton of things at the state level that allow you to vacuum up money for your connected firms. They just haven't shown that's true. And in fact, no one's shown that true. And all the suggestive evidence up to this point is that losing any type of election has a negative impact on your future political career. And so by almost uh, some kind of transitory mechanism, any connected firm's connection to your political career. Okay, and secondly, the effect over time. Okay, so the effect is mostly pronounced for the earlier part of these politicians' careers and subsequently fades away over time, right? This seems at odds for a couple of reasons that we have in mind. Um, first, politicians as we know, right? And as Trey mentioned, they only become more powerful over time, right? And this comes from lots of sources, right? Political power, knowledge, political favors, log rolling, vote trading. I have some work that looks at this and you do vote trade in particular to other connected Congress people, which increases over time um, and just structural aspects of the way the congressional IO works, which is seniority just comes and you get to access to better committees the longer you've been there, more powerful committees. Um, so a great example, this is Robert Byrd in West Virginia, who not only got more powerful, but also was able to siphon off more resources towards states connected, his, his state of West Virginia, and connected firms in that state as he got more powerful. Um, and not only that, but media scrutiny increases over time too. Okay, And so we see that in just the number of mentions of powerful politicians over time. There are significantly more to powerful politicians then think CNN, CNBC, just cover them more than less powerful, early career politicians, okay? And if you look at that, look, that's just borne out in the data, right? The most powerful politicians. So I collected this 
um, and get ready for the discussion. So this is what's currently true. This is the mark to market in the US Congress right now. The Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, 79. The average age of senators after this past election, 63. And the average age of newly elected senators, right, is a ripe and young 56.6. And compare that to the House, and we have 81 for Nancy Pelosi. We have 57.6 for the representatives and 50.6 for the newly elected representatives. So in some ways, we shouldn't expect this effect to go down over time. Right? It should only be increasing as the magnitude, the stakes are increasing, right? Um, and so the paper focuses on probability in its model, but not as much on stakes. Now, um, the paper does find some suggestive evidence, like Trang mentioned, that this is true, right? And like she said, it's a small sample of these um, politicians that have a close election that are very senior. Those are positive. And she's totally right. So they find some evidence. That's awesome in the data. Now, the tricky part about that is the identification, right? And our inference around those. And why? Well, look. What is a senior politician, somebody, Robert Byrd, right? Somebody who's super valuable to their state and to firms, what do they have to do to end up in a close election? And the answer is to end up in a close election once you've been there for 30 years, it's often some outside shock that gets you there. Think like a scandal that makes you vulnerable, politically vulnerable, okay? And so more generally, politicians that face close elections along the continuum of their seniority, so as they become more senior, um, they're likely a selected sample. So we can't think like the paper tries to do in its inference of varying time independently of all these other shocks that are coming on. And if all the other shocks are driving things, then it's no longer time that's driving things. And it's no longer time that's driving things. We can't use that same inference and generalized inference by saying, oh yeah, it's career, right? We're just going to use time and say, oh, it's stronger in early career than later career because it has nothing to do with time or career really here. It has to do with these outside shocks scandal that's causing things to happen. And so I think the paper needs to do more to convince us of this and many of their other proposed mechanisms that when put into this close election framework, close election identification does not buy you exogeneity across all inference dimensions. And so I think the paper needs to think a little bit more about the inference dimension along which it drives uh, generalizability. And so that's it for my side. Look, I commend the authors for bringing, I think, a really intriguing trade-off more into the forefront, right? It's always been there, but they're saying, hey, look, it's time for us to take this more seriously as a profession, as regulators, right? Policymakers, we got to take this more seriously. Moreover, I think the paper establishes a number of intriguing results for academics, for insiders, political insiders, and for regulators to both understand and which merit further exploration and what kind of exploration. Well, look, while I think the predictions and empirical relations thus far are intriguing, look, I have remaining questions regarding the exact proposed mechanism and that trade off. So I think better empirical founding of that precise mechanism, which they, again, need to overturn our priors, which are pretty strong from data and political science and economics, needs to be done in order to move this even more centrally back. Okay, with that, I, I want to thank you again, and I'll turn it back over to the author. Thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, Trank, I'm going to give you maybe a few minutes to, to respond uh, before we might go to the Q&A. Is that good? Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for um, a really insightful discussions and for a lot of um, um, very sort of intriguing and, and important food for thoughts. And we definitely will take your suggestions seriously. Um, so I have some very quick comments to some of the points that you raised. Uh, you're right that there is a very rich and large literature on political connections and favoritisms uh, toward firms uh, in the US and outside of the US that showed an uh, opposite effect or often effect in the opposite directions. So it's true that what we're showing here um, is somewhat of an outlier. And as I uh, emphasize it uh, a lot of time in my discussions, that the effect that we're finding uh, through close elections, uh, what we're finding here is an on average effect. But there's a lot of heterogeneity in that effect in the times of what type of firms really benefit from this and what type of politicians are actually creating this adverse effect. And what we find, uh, as I propose uh, in the paper, is that it's really for a subset of firms that are more likely closely linked to the states, the smaller firms who operate within the state dimensions and also driven by the politicians coming from state politics. And you're right in, in uh, suggesting that we should do further work in showing that and whether these politicians end up going back you know, in the future, going back to state politics, because that is needed for our story uh, to go through. And indeed, uh, we did quite a bit of data collections uh, on you know, where they actually go, uh, end up after losing a congressional elections. 
and the one that coming from state politics, a lot of them end up going back to state politics. So the literature is on political science saying that losing a connection is generally bad for the politician career in the sense in the bad in the sense that if the politicians care about moving to Congress, losing one certain collections is probably not good news for them. That probably hurt their future chance. And from the private perspective of the politician, um, that's bad news. But it doesn't really say that it's actually significantly hurt their chance of continuing what they've been doing in the state. So at least um, we're not in a position to actually uh, precisely or give our uh, exact estimate of you know, whether that really hurt their chance at the state. But we do find evidence that a lot of them eventually go back to the state. But I fully agree with you that uh, we probably need to do a little bit more work here. I think also on your point on the effect over time, very well taken, uh, definitely um, something, um, um, you know, the, the fact that a lot of older positions are likely to be the more powerful one. And so is it really about career concern? Is it about power? And so that's the reason why we focus on the challenges. So not the incumbents who've been in Congress for a long time, who are likely to have much stronger power, but the incumbents who we argue are likely to have relatively little power once they become new uh, comer in Congress if they are elected. Of course, it's still true that the challengers who are actually running for uh, Congress elections at the age of 30 are not exactly the same as the challengers who run for Congress uh, at the age of 60. Um, so that's remained a bit of a concern, but I think that's a largely elevated concern that age is closely uh, related or correlated with uh, their power and seniority in Congress. And I think um, your point on the interaction, um, a lot of the results that we're showing by splitting or seeing the effect, how it varies um, by different level of state scrutiny or firm characteristics and all of that. So the close elections by identification um, at the mid level, at the interaction level, uh, definitely the power of RDD is much weaker and we cannot claim full causality there. And so for uh, some of uh, the exercise and one of it, um, the very important exercise on state level scrutiny, uh, we did try to see how the effect varies with another variable, uh, we call the average lock distance to capital city. Uh, which is a predetermined variables of, of state level corruptions and scrutiny that is way, uh, predefined uh, in the pre 20, uh, decades before uh, the study period. It's more likely to be uh, exogenous or predetermined characteristic. Uh, we do find the same um, pattern and result, which sort of led us more confidence in the result that we're showing. But I fully take your point that um, the interaction or the, the, in, the interpretation of the interaction should be taken with caution. And thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for uh, very helpful comments. Uh, thank you very much, Twang. Uh, Lauren, do, do you have any last few words if you may want to come back or are you good? Uh, no, no, no. That, that was great. I look forward to, to seeing future versions of the paper and we'll open it up to Q&A. Great. Thank you very much. Coming. Okay, then. Uh, then I think before uh, going into the Q&A box, I'm going to use the organizer advantage to, to give it to, to Thorsten uh, to, for his question and then maybe uh, to the Q&A. And we already had a few questions which are answered by uh, QA, uh, your co-author, quite efficiently. So thanks for, for the live help with the questions as well, QA. Uh, so Thorsten, please go ahead. Yeah, so on the, on the efficiency, of course, that uh, reduces the Q and uh, the, the time for discussion, right? Because the, the course is too efficient, so to say. And, uh, um, but that's okay. I mean, that's, that's great. Um, so first of all, I mean, I, I kind of, um, um, uh, I'm kind of feel with Lauren that, um, um, that this result is surprising. And uh, being part of the dismal uh, uh, science, of course, we always like to think the worst of people. Um, so we're kind of puzzled by this results where scrutiny uh, seems to be stronger than uh, uh, um, than uh, kind of fraud or kind of connections. Um, um, but maybe we should be happy, right? But no, so that's not really the issue, right? So um, one thing I kind of missed, um, uh, often in these kind of uh, uh, papers or these kind of uh, research, one looks at surprises, right? So I remember actually, I think it was last year, actually, we had a paper on the surprise coming from the Trump election and how this, and I think it has been published by now, um, how this in 2016, how this actually has positively affected the, uh, the firms that were connected to Trump. Um, so again, this goes against what we see here. So have you looked into this kind of the, the surprise element? Um, the second question I had is, um, when you look, when you compare the, the kind of the, the effect across different types of firms, um, I mean, in order to kind of compare the coefficient sizes, don't you have to kind of, for the co economic effect, kind of look at the uh, kind of the, the, the product of both the coefficient times 
uh, the probability of ha having a connection with the firms. I mean, so is there kind of, um, uh, I mean, if uh, you might be, it's more likely to be connected to a small firm, uh, sorry, less likely to be connected to a given third small firm than to a, to a very large firm where uh, given that there are more people in management, maybe everybody has a, uh, has a, uh, a connection with that. Um, and then finally, actually coming up again to kind of uh, reiterate what Lauren said about these, uh, the sample of incumbent senators that lose in a tight election. I think there are, these are probably very specific cases. I mean, I can think about Dom Desch, Tom, Tom Deschle, for example, right? Um, so these are kind of, uh, yeah, these are kind of people who uh, run kind of um, in a state which is not of their own party, so to say, which in the presidential election always vote against uh, their own party. Uh, but then somehow get caught in a wave election, right? So these might be very specific cases. Um, but again, this is, I guess, uh, one of the problems that you have. Um, I mean, given that there have been so many wave elections over the last uh, 10 years, uh, it, it's kind of hard to kind of plug all of these data into election because you could argue that every single observation is kind of uh, a unique one, right? Every election is kind of unique and uh, you can't really explain it very much. So actually, uh, of course, you can also argue that this kind of biases against finding significant results and you find very strong results. So um, um, I guess some... Um, I, mean, I, I guess with like Lauren, I'm still a bit confused. I mean, uh, so I'd like to believe the results, uh, kind of think in a positive role of scrutiny. But um, then again, I think as uh, Lauren also, I think I, um, I'd like to see more evidence. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, Charleston. So um, yeah, a, a lot of things that you brought up here. So first on the surprise element, um, we would argue that the set of closed elections we're looking at now baseline sample for identifications um, seems to be a surprise. At least uh, we find evidence that, um, so when we look at the market value of the firm, the mean of that uh, before the election, we see that firms are connected to winners and firms are connected to losers are um, exactly uh, symmetric across the Z. Um, so basically effectively we find 2.8 and that is actually an equal decrease in the value of the firms that are uh, connected to winners, so they actually have a, a, a sort of like a negative adjustment that is symmetric to the positive adjustment of the firms that are connected to the defeat, which is which um, allow us to interpret that the market before the elections actually um, predict the closed elections quite accurately. And given that what they are expecting as being the closed election, the closed election itself is not a surprise, but the outcome, the result, you know, what is actually uh, eventually become um, the result uh, is really a surprise or sort of completely unpredicted by the market uh, from that result. And of course, uh, for the time period we are looking at, um, we don't have uh, a lot of data on prediction market. So um, to really go to prediction market to get further evidence of you know, really whether this is a surprise element uh, is quite a challenge um, in terms of data. Um, I think your second question is on um, how do we interpret the effect? Um, to be honest, I'm not absolutely clear on the, the, the questions and exactly you're adding it. Um, but my understanding is that um, whether the set of firms that we're finding the effect here, they varies a lot in size. And so the average of 2.8% that I report here is driven mostly by the small firms. And so when we actually look at the monetary effect, um, what does you know, how the magnitude of that, we look at the median firm, or fall into sort of you know, the set of smaller firms. But if you actually really weight this effect by the mark, sort of the size of the, of the firm, because the effect on the, the larger firms are actually um, much closer to zero or can potentially be positive. Um, the weighted average uh, effect by firm size um, uh, can be um, somewhere close to zero. So we haven't done the exercise, but I would argue that it definitely, you know, if you weight it by the size of firm, it will be much closer to zero. It will be smaller than 2.8% uh, in magnitude. Um, and that might be um, um, what you know, closer to what the literature has shown. That may be the average effect. Once you consider the sites, uh, can potentially be different. All right. Uh, I guess. Yeah. We, yeah. We we might get back to uh, Maria Sunta with one last question before our break. Yeah. Uh, we can maybe squeeze that in, Maria Sunta. So I think that scrutiny is a um, fascinating hypothesis, but I'm wondering whether there is something more boring that might be going on and is consistent with the fact that these firms are smaller. So the sphere of these politicians that are elected, okay, goes from being influential at the state level to having to pay attention to more national things. 
So I assume that uh, the small firms were getting a lot of contracts uh, at uh, the state level. Now the politician moves uh, to DC, won't care about uh, his friend any longer. So they expect uh, to have reduced business in uh, the state. So this would explain most of your results, but uh, it's not a scrutiny, it's uh, someone else is getting favors. So I'm wondering whether you could discuss uh, this alternative explanation. Yeah, definitely. So it's, yeah, so basically, I think that the strongest evidence that we have that would be consistent uh, with our explanations and harder to explain uh, by uh, the other explanations would be the effect by scrutiny. And the fact that we see this very strong effect in the state that have low scrutiny, both at the state level or general low interest in political, um, in, in, uh, political news. Because if that would, is it really different by the fact that you know, out of sight, out of mind, you know, the politicians get to federal uh, politics and either they're too busy with other things or they are busy giving out favors to other title firms. Um, it would be, you know, it would be hard to, to see that why is it we see a much stronger effect among the one that is much more scrutinized at the state level. Well, you see stronger effect in states with high corruption and low scrutiny, right? So there you can give also more of fa uh, favor to your friends. So I'm not sure it's very different. Perhaps you can look at the business of these firms and where they are getting the contracts and uh, their customers and so on. Yeah. And another yeah. one that, yeah, but another yeah. one is a little, a, a little more, I think I would say much more suggestive, but yeah. definitely that we would love to explore more, is the fact that the connected directors, after uh, being connected to the congressmen, they leave the firm in questions, but we do not find that they actually become directors of larger firms, you know, firms that, you know, more likely to, you know, if you think that it's really mm -hmm. because they're now giving firms or, or favors with firms that might bring them more benefit, we would expect these directors actually move to those side of firms, right? And for a lot of time, we see that they're more likely to leave the small firms and uh, disappear in the data set instead of moving to the larger firms. But that's rather suggestive evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, uh, I think as promised, we could uh, kind of end this session, despite the fact that there are a few questions maybe that are standing, we could maybe like reply them in written form uh, later on, but as promised, let's give the audience uh, seven minutes of break, and then we will start for the next paper in the beginning of the new hour. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, Trang and Lauren, for the very nice presentation and the discussion, and all the quarters for very effective replies. So see you in seven minutes. Thanks, Dr. Lawrence, and uh, all the questions. Um, and yes, please do send in further questions in the chat. We uh, love to continue the conversation.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back to second Political Finance London Political Finance Polfin Workshop. Uh, this is our first session, and we are going to be switching to our second paper. Uh, before we switch again, I need to remind you uh, two things. If you are in the panelist uh, uh, in the event, please remember to ask your questions through the through the chat box, uh, and always targeting uh, everyone in that in that in that box. And if you are an attendee, please uh, only use the Q&A box for any paper-related uh, questions. So again, also to remind you that the sessions are being recorded and uh, are, we, are, we aim to post them later on. So in our second paper, we are gonna be uh, switching uh, to a topic on politicizing anti-bribery enforcement. And uh, we'll have our presenter, Bo Li, all the way from Xinhua University. And uh, Boli, feel free, please, uh, to, to share your screen right now. You will have, again, 30 minutes, uh, and we will aim to interfere as little as possible during your presentation. Uh, and then we'll spare most of the questions, hopefully, um, in the Q&A uh, session. Uh, so please, uh, the floor is uh, yours. All right, um, so great. Thanks for including our paper in the program. Um, this is a joint work with uh, Lauren Cohen, who is also in the panelist. Um, so uh, there is consensus that a level playing field is uh, essential for fun, uh, economic efficiency. And then we observe numerous papers document how bribing activity can distort competition, such as if there were a certain group of firms. Um, uh, and then this would lead to, will lead to inefficiency allocation of capital and production process. So as uh, what we observed from the first paper. Now this would have given rationale uh, in terms of anti-bribery enforcement. So we observe different cases within the in a within country setting, such as in China, Brazil, uh, there are waves of anti-bribery enforcement and we see different outcomes. Uh, but however, if we think about the anti-bribery enforcement globally, uh, this question is tricky. So it depends on who are we going to enforce against, when are we going to enforce against, as well as where are we going to enforce against. Why? Because with regulators, they have limited information and they have limited budget. So this could uh, give rise to discretionary in terms of enforcement. Now, consistent with the theme of this conference, so we are going to explore the question, do political motives drive the enforcement action? So we believe this question is fundamental for us to understand about the, uh, how would uh, anti-bribery anti enforce, what, what are the political uh, motives behind those uh, anti-bribery enforcement, as well as on the, how would have implications on the operation of multinational firms. Okay, let me start from some of the uh, institutional background. So uh, that FCPA was uh, initiated in 1977, and the goal, initial goal was to prohibit bribery of foreign government officials, and then with the intention to create a level playing field. And as you can see from the uh, panel, so uh, we depict a number of cases from 1978 until recent period. So uh, the regulatory agencies overall has targeted the firm from headquarters from over 70 countries. And surprisingly, so in the period after 2000, we observed increasing in the number of cases against foreign companies, which is the red bar, and then the blue bar is denoted enforcement against the US companies. So even it outpaced the red bar, outpaced the blue bars. Um, so uh, this gives us uh, um, uh, raise the question about political incentives. So as those cases are going to be brought about uh, by the SEC and DOJ uh, with the uh, congressional oversight. Okay, um, here's one additional uh, institutional feature associated with those enforcement of the, those cases. Uh, over time, so there is a, a time lag between the bribery actions and any bribery enforcement action. So here I should apply the number of years uh, from initial and uh, bribing activity until the eventual enforcement. So the average timing is about eight years. So now this is surprising for us to thinking about, uh, especially uh, on the political incentive behind the regular enforcement. It's uh, why, because this would give discretion to regulators. When should they enforce against those firms? Okay, so uh, essentially in this paper, we are going to explore a uh, uh, very simple question. Do political incentives influence the uh, anti uh, enforcement actions? Now, um, in terms of data, so we collect, we hand collect the case study uh, data on uh, enforcement uh, actions uh, by SEC and DOJ. Um, so we collect information on countries involved, where they are headquartered in, as well as all subsidiaries. 
as well as uh, this report that handled that case. Uh, and also we uh, obtain information on the penalty associated with each of the cases. So I'm going to show you some of the results uh, in the last bit of the slide. And then furthermore, we are going to uh, look at the global company, which is both the US and foreign companies. We augment their subsidiary level data as well as we are going to zoom in on its production networks. So we are going to look at what are the also uh, the interaction between political incentive and economic uh, motives. And furthermore, so in terms of identification, we are going to use variation in the political incentives by using timing out in the elections, given this predetermined. And then, so we are going to use this kind of cross-sectional and time series heterogeneity in the timing of elections to understand about this question. And then here are the uh, our results. First, regulators do not respond equally across all firms. So we use a uh, lot of variation in the Senate election. And then our results show that in the year leading up the elections, um, the enforcement actions increases uh, against foreign companies by 23%. And this is also statistically significant. However, we do not see such patterns for the US companies in the, in the pre-election years. Now, this is um, first surprising even with your first explore this research question. And also um, we explore, so whether this is a recent phenomenon or uh, it's a, a, a past phenomenon. Our results also show that the effect is pronounced in the recent period. So especially if we zoom in, in the to after 2006 until the uh, 2017, which include uh, four elections, we are able to observe the balance of four and four election across different states. And furthermore, so we explore the political incentives. So we look at this uh, in terms of constitutional interest. Our results indicate that. So um, the likelihood of enforcement against foreign companies is going to be reduced in industries with large number of US establishment or employment. Um, so uh, why this case? Because uh, um, the, uh, the cost of targeting those companies is going to outweigh the benefits in terms of enforcement action. Because if you observe um, lots of foreign companies located in certain constituents, so um, regulator will have less incentive to enforce against those foreign companies. And also consistent with uh, uh, political economy literature, our results show that uh, um, the enforcement action is going to increase in state whose senators uh, are appointed as chair of the judicial committee, given it's more likely going to receive the oversight uh, in terms of the enforcement. And furthermore, we want to understand about the economic motives. Um, so we did the following. So we explore the role of competition. Our results indicate that. So the likelihood of enforcement against the foreign companies increased if they are going to compete with US companies. So, uh, and then so we use this, uh, we use firm level competition between uh, uh, global companies. So we are able to document. So how does the enforcement action really respond to the competition uh, between uh, multinational firms? And furthermore, uh, we use supply chain uh, network data. So our results also show that. So the likelihood of the enforcement against foreign companies increase if um, foreign company, they have extensive production network outside the US. So that means they have less exposure to the US network. So in this case, the regulators would have more incentive to target foreign companies. Why? So again, so they will have less costs associated with uh, anti-bribery enforcement. Okay, lastly, uh, we uh, provide some suggestive evidence how to firm re respond to the enforcement. Our results, we look at uh, both the extensive margin as well as the intensive margin. Our results show that there will be a reduction in the segment uh, uh, ex corruption exposure after the enforcement action. Now, surprisingly, so we also provide some bright side uh, about the story. So um, both for US and foreign companies, so those com uh, they are going to reduce the corruption exposure after the enforcement. And then we also, um, our results also show uh, prevails in the in intensive margin. So that means uh, uh, both US and foreign companies um, are going to experience reduction in the sales uh, in those perceived crop countries. And uh, lastly, uh, we do a cross country comparison. We want to understand which countries are more sensitive to the FCPA. Our results show that firms headquartered in the low crop countries, such as Norway, are more likely going to reduce corruption exposure even more. So that means they are more sensitive to enforcement actions. So overall, um, so uh, both US and foreign companies are going to converge to a level, a lower level of uh, corruption exposure. Okay, uh, let me provide even more, some more uh, institutional background. So why does political uh, motive matter? So from there, there's some statement from DOG and then uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. 
And then it states that the department takes serious actions to provide guidance in this area. And then the statement from the Senate Judicial Committee also states that the part of its oversight functions over the Justice Department. And this committee is well suited to examine the impact of S FCTA and ask hard questions about especially the issues related to American job creation and et cetera. So, um, so this gave us some uh, insight about the, how political incentive may matter in the anti-bribery enforcement actions. And then the, um, let me also show you one case. So this is related to the total, so which um, uh, is related to settlement close to 400 million. And then, so why? Because they paid uh, about 60 million in bribes to a Iranian government official. And then, so one style feature is the bribery activity took place about two decades ago. So in between 1995 to 1997. So, and then, so um, given the time lag, substantial time lag between the bribery action and enforcement. So um, this leads us to think about the, uh, so when would regulators uh, target those foreign companies? And surprisingly also, so we look at that there is an Exxon Mobil also had their quarter in Texas, while the biggest competitor of total. And then in year 2014, there is an election happens and then incumbent uh, uh, Senator John Corney is uh, run for re-election and he ran. So guess what? The set settlement reached, uh, was reached uh, one year prior to the election. So in May 29th, 2013. So to give us this, um, we hope it gave us some anecdotal evidence such that political incentive matter. Okay, so here's our data. So we spent quite a lot of time to and carefully collect the case level data. So this would involve close to 400 investigations as well as 589 enforcement actions during the whole sample period. And then this will involve more than 120 countries. So it is very expensive. And we also hand collect information on the dates, which means the period of bribery case initiation, as well as the ultimate resolution period. And then uh, we also play information on the district court plus such that it handled this case, uh, countries involved, and also we look at the subsidiary involved. And furthermore, so it, those cases also include information on who are the prosecution agencies, and even it could be, uh, there could be whistleblower in these cases. And finally, we look at the resolution outcome. So what is the uh, bribery payment, sanction to bribery ratio, whether this is associated with plea agreement, and then uh, how many number of countries were involved, et cetera. So I'm going to show you um, some of these uh, case level uh, analysis uh, in the later part of the presentation. Okay, so we are going to augment the, our case um, level data with the standard US in the elections. And then so, and furthermore, so our firm level data include both US companies and global companies. So uh, we, uh, um, we, 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 we uh, restrict our analysis to US companies, they need to have operations globally, as well as foreign companies, they have operations in the US. So uh, for those companies, they are more likely being subject to FCP investigations. And then, so uh, furthermore, we are going to augment uh, the data from the global uh, network exposure at firm level using fact set data. So we are able to document who are the competitors as well as the supply chain network uh, in the global space. And then, so here I list the top 10 countries involved. So probably this is consistent with your perception about the headquarter uh, country where the firms are from. So the top on the list are China, uh, in the, uh, Venezuela, Brazil, and Russia, as you, you would expect. So uh, here, in the number of cases, so China outpaced our other countries. And then, so the, they are more likely going to have a higher level of corruption score. And before I jump to the uh, full analysis, so let me show you the event study. So on the left panel, I show the US companies. So in the period, uh, four quarters prior to election, and then four quarters after election, we do not observe substantial changes in the number of uh, enforcement action. But however, if we zoom in on the foreign companies, we see a different picture. Especially uh, uh, in the first, uh, in the quarter prior to election, we observed substantial increases in number of cases against foreign companies. So uh, by how much? So they jump to uh, about 50, uh, so in the six months prior to the election. Okay, so here is our specification. We explore the variation in timing of Sunday elections. And here we are going to, uh, our data is at uh, country C. If a firm is I is from country C, uh, located with its main operation in US state S and in year T. 
And then so uh, we here is a dummy target whether the firm is being targeted by the regulators. And our pre-election is equal to one if one year prior to election uh, in state S and zero otherwise. So we augment it with our uh, sets of firm level controls as well as state level controls. And then um, it's essential for us to um, um, control a whole set of fixed effects, including the country, state, from a year. So we are going to do this in all these analysis. And our standard area is classed from level. So here is our baseline analysis. Um, I show separately. So uh, for the overall sample, for the US companies, as well as for the foreign companies. One of the stylized fact is that if you look at the column four, so this is for a whole sample period. So foreign companies are more likely being subject to anti-bribery enforcement. By how much? By uh, roughly 23% in the year leading up to elections. And then furthermore, I'm going to, if I look at the recent period, so uh, which is shown in column five, so uh, again, the result is even more pronounced, almost double. So, uh, so there's strong effects, um, um, so that which indicate that in the year, uh, leading up the elections, uh, anti-bribery enforcement against the foreign companies increased by about 46%. But however, we do not observe any effect on the U.S. companies. So as shown in the column two and the column three, both in the whole sample period as well as in the recent period. Okay, so uh, in terms of political motive, so first we look at the constituent interest. In here, we look at the local concentration. So the share of uh, industry, each of the industry, so, and here, um, especially one of the stylized fact is um, in the year leading up to elections, um, uh, in those industries, uh, if they have lo if they are ha locally concentrated, so um, those foreign companies are going to face reduction in the property enforcement by how much? By 30%. So if the uh, industry concentration increased from 25th percentile to 75th percentile. Why this case? Because it's more costly for the regulator to target those foreign companies if those foreign companies have substantial business in the local uh, economy. And furthermore, also we look at the congressional influence. So we also should, we uh, we do an interaction between pre-election and judicial chair. Our result again show that in the year leading up to elections, uh, for states, uh, so with uh, the Judiciary Committee Chair uh, appointed. So this will increase the likelihood of being targeted. But how much, again, so um, there are more regulators in Central are more responsive uh, uh, on foreign companies. But however, again, so uh, there is, we do not observe any effect on the US companies. And furthermore, so we, we look at, we want to understand uh, especially the interaction between political motive and the economic incentive. In here, uh, we zoom in using the uh, from network level data. So uh, here we interact pre-election with foreign network. So essentially our foreign network is captured by share of supply chain network located outside of their home country. Again, the result indicates that, so uh, US company, they do not experience any increases in enforcement actions. But however, for foreign companies, we see a different, different picture. So um, Indeed, so uh, their likelihood of enforcement increased uh, substantially uh, in the period pre-election and if uh, they have substantial network abroad, so outside of the US. And furthermore, we look at the role of competition. So uh, there is increasing debate on so how does US company and foreign company compete with each other. We want to learn about what is the implication on the anti-bribery enforcement. And again, so um, Having um, uh, more, um, so again, we do not observe uh, any effect against the uh, US company. So that means enforcement actions on US company are insensitive uh, to foreign competition. But however, enforcement action on foreign companies increased by about 40, 24%. So if we increase the, if we increase the fraction of foreign competition first. And so probably the next, next question is who are those foreign competitors? Again, we decompose. Uh, with US competitors and versus non-US competitors. Again, our effect is mainly driven by US competitors. So that means if for a foreign company, if they are competing with a US firm, um, they are more likely going to uh, face a high likelihood of enforcement actions in the pre-election years. And then furthermore, um, the next question is, um, um, who are the regulators? So given uh, both DOJ and the SEC can initiate anti-bribery enforcement. 
So again, so we use uh, case level data, we analyze uh, enforcement action between SEC and DOJ. Again, our results show that in the pre-election year, um, the discretionary enforcement action is mainly driven by DOJ. So as shown uh, um, um, on the policy coefficient. Again, so surprising even for the US firm, so they face an even lower likelihood of enforcement action. And here I show furthermore on the number of, on the uh, using case level uh, analysis. Here we want to compare in the non-election year versus in election years. So whether those cases are more likely going to represent the weaker cases. So that means those cases never are reaching harm. So they are going to be associated with plea agreements. And indeed our results show that. So in the election years, so those cases are never going to reach in court. And also they are more likely going to have plea agreements. So that means those are the weaker cases going to uh, end up in resolutions. And also, uh, we also uh, look at the case of Nancy in terms of sanction to bribe ratio. Again, so these are weaker cases. Why? Because the, the, these are associated with a lower sanction to bribery ratio as a, well as less form of bribery payment. Okay. And then for, so lastly, I'm going to show you some suggestive evidence on uh, how to firm respond to anti-bribery enforcement in terms of the corruption exposure afterwards. Again, so here we look at the separate. Um, so uh, after targeting US company and after targeting a foreign company, um, here we have more uh, bright side of the story. Our result indicates that for both US and foreign companies, they are more likely to going to reduce their corruption exposure after uh, enforcement actions. So even though um, the magnitude for foreign com firms is slightly higher, and also uh, they are going to reduce their segments in the top 50 corrupt countries and top 100 countries and et cetera. And furthermore, so we look at the intensive margin in terms of segment sales. Again, so we observe both for the US and foreign companies, they are going to reduce their uh, segment sales in the top 50 and top 100 most corrupt countries after anti bribery enforcement. So this suggests the, um, the anti bribery enforcement indeed has its intended consequences. And those firms uh, are going to converge to a lower level of uh, bribery, uh, um, corruption exposure later on. And then the last question we want to explore is given um, our sample represent a global firm, we want to understand so in a cross country setting, um, so which type of, kind of firms are more sensitive to anti bribery enforcement? Here we interact uh, uh, after we, what we want to look at, so after anti bribery enforcement, especially on the foreign companies, so whether um, the, they are more sensitive uh, in terms of reducing corruption exposure for firms from high perceived corrupt countries. Our results show that, so firms from um, low corruption countries reduce their exposure even more relative to those uh, firms from high corrupt countries, such as from China or Brazil. And then, so all results indicate that in a cross country comparison, so they converge to a lower level of corruption level. So as indicated also from the previous two tables, uh, both for the US and foreign companies. So they are more likely going to reduce the corruption exposure in the top 50 and top 100 uh, uh, crop countries. Okay, um, so let me wrap up. So, um, so in this paper, we document the political incentives um, that would drive the anti bribery enforcement actions. So, I will be doing this the first step was to understand about the, uh, what are the political incentives and uh, whether there could be any discretionary enforcement actions. Uh, surprisingly, even uh, to our understanding, so um, political incentive matters in the anti bribery enforcement actions, and this is in contrast to um, the law was envisioned for to creating a level playing field. So I wouldn't uh, recap our results. So um, so we believe our uh, um, analysis is important for us to understand about the uh, uh, political motive behind the uh, regulatory enforcement, especially given future debate about global integration and trade, as well as operation of multinational firms. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Bo, for this very concise and uh, nice compact presentation. Uh, again, I think I am, I'm a lucky chair today because uh, presentations are ending slightly earlier than expected. So we have more time to, to discuss. Uh, so I'm gonna not take too much time, just uh, switch to the discussant. I think Randy Kostner is with us from University of Chicago. Randy, please feel free to, to share your screen. Uh, and you will have 10 minutes. And again, with a bit of flexibility, maybe you can add a couple of minutes on top of that, given that we are uh, a bit early. 
So I think I will uh, also contribute to the uh, the collective uh, collective comments because I think my comments will be relatively short. I don't have a, uh, a formal presentation on. I, I don't like doing formal presentations uh, from presentation slides on, on Zoom. It seems very hard to um, to follow. And also, also I, I think the presentation was so clear. Uh, there's really no need uh, no need for me to to uh, go over the uh, uh, go over the results. Um, I think this is a, a very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting and valuable paper to think about uh, the role of politics on affecting um, uh, uh, court actions and uh, uh, different types of cases. I think that's, uh, I haven't seen a lot of work in that area. I've seen other, um, uh, other um, ways of looking at how politics may be influencing government actions, but um, uh, this I think is uh, is quite original in um, in looking at the the timing of uh, and uh, and uh, quality of the, the cases that uh, that are brought, and so so I think uh, the evidence seems um, uh, quite uh, quite straightforward, both in kind of just the simple looking at the graphs as well as the uh, uh, the, the the more sophisticated analysis that. Um, it doesn't seem to be random uh, that uh, uh, that cases are brought against um, uh, foreign firms versus domestic firms, and uh, the timing of those is, is very much around um, around elections. And then uh, there, are, you know, the reasonable economic variables and political variables are brought in to uh, to to, uh, to look at that, looking at the role of foreign competition, uh, looking at uh, whether the you know the, the committee chair of the judiciary committee, those uh, those kinds of things. I think those are very very interesting. So I think rather than um, focus on, and, and I think the uh, the, uh, the analysis is, uh, was uh, empirical analysis very well done. And so what I think I'd like to do is try to, to, to put this into a bigger picture context of what are the questions, broader questions that it raises and how we might use this type of approach and this analysis in, in other arenas. And also, I, I think we have to give uh, a lot of credit to the uh, the authors for putting together this uh, this data set. Um, this was not something that was, I think, uh, easily machine downloadable, um, but I think uh, valuable to uh, to put uh, to put together. So first, um, it might be interesting to look uh, beyond uh, the uh, the committee chairs to also look at the composition of the of the relevant oversight committees for uh, judiciary and for the uh, the SEC to see if it's in addition to the chairs that there might be uh, some uh, some role that uh, that other the committee membership uh, committee membership may play. Um, it may be interesting to uh, to see uh, whether the um, uh, with with the, the how the control of Congress and the uh, the role of the president's party plays in this, and so uh, so obviously the president's party uh, uh, has uh, has uh, the impact on uh, on DOJ and SEC of being able to name the uh, name the the chairs of those, uh, but maybe the influence is different when um, it's either because you can check for Republicans versus Democrats, and you can also check for divided uh, divided Congress and uh, and separate from the president and then house house versus senate i think those those might be interesting things to to look at also looking at uh, broader economic conditions um, of just trying to think about well, where is the state of the economy in the years leading uh, leading up to it do we see more enforcement in weaker economies stronger economies um, uh, also um, I, I should have said this from from before also when the if the president is going to be uh, reelected or it's not going to be reelected, but is up for reelection or not, uh, or at the end of the second term, does that have an impact on um, on how they might uh, how they might uh, how they might act? And then there might be some interesting things to look at in terms of political action committee contributions. Work that some of the work that I've done with uh, Stratman and with uh, uh, with Strawn, looking at uh, some of those, because it might be interesting to see how that plays into this. Is this something where there are more contributions that are made by the competitors to members of the uh, other relevant oversight committees? Uh, that might be another way of trying to get at this, to try to understand the mechanism for the influence that, uh, that might, be, uh, might be coming in. Um, I think that would be you know, interesting to look at. And also, is there a response by uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, the foreign firms that may have U.S. U.S. activities, um, how do they respond in terms of their political action committee contributions? That might be interesting to uh, to look at also. And uh, there's some uh, databases on on lobbying, and so looking at some of those sort of complementary uh, complementary pieces. 
And then I think uh, that, you know, obviously this is one very interesting set of legal cases to look at, but there are a lot of other choices that um, the Department of Justice and other enforcement agencies undertake. And so um, antitrust, for example. Uh, so there are a lot of um, antitrust cases being brought to, you know, I'm sitting here and well, here, we're here in Europe, I'm here in London. Um, obviously, a lot of antitrust uh, actions being undertaken against um, large U.S. tech firms. But also, um, it you know, sort of may be interesting to note that um, uh, it was the Trump administration in its last year that brought an antitrust lawsuit uh, against Google. And so there might be something interesting on the timing of those. Um, of, you know, and um, uh, so it could be big tech firms, it could be other issues, other populist issues or other issues that, that may come up. So I think that's, a, that's something interesting. I think also there are other um, international, you know, like uh, international organizations. So we can look to like World Trade Organization, those kinds of things of, do we see more actions being brought at uh, different time periods? Are those actions being related to firms that are, um, related to some oversight committee, whether it's an agricultural oversight committee or an auto oversight committee. Um, so I think there are a lot of, lot of interesting things to, to think about it by applying this kind of structure and this kind of thinking to not just this, uh, this particular application, which I think is a very good and very sensible one, um, but it just strikes me that there are a lot of other legal cases that, uh, or types of legal actions that one could look at in this uh, in this uh, same type of uh, same type of framework, and then there are other things that we could look at. You know, as I said, with you know, political action committee contributions, lobbying efforts, um, seeing what the mechanism is, because I think that's something that um, we don't fully understand about the um, uh, the roles of the different, whether it's uh, the roles of the oversight committee, of Congress, the roles of the um, the House and the Senate, and the president. And then leading to particular um, particular outcomes of a choice to bring a case or uh, or not not bring a case. Um, so I think that's uh, uh, I'm going to give uh, give some of the time back, uh, much like the the uh, presenters did, because um, I think this is really great to to think about not just the particulars of the of the paper, but all the different applications that we could make of this this type of framework. Um, or thinking about political influence on uh, legal uh, legal actions, whether they are other court cases or things in WTO and potentially in other, other areas. Thanks. So Randy, thank you so much for these comments. They're superb and they give us a ton of awesome things to look into empirically. So we'll absolutely circle back on all these. Many, many thanks on this. I'm always, I'm always good at generating uh, work for other people. Yes, uh, yeah, we appreciate it. This is the best kind of work. Best kind of work. <laughs> it makes our hearts warm as empiricists, for sure. Thank you so much. Especially as a deputy dean, I do that kind of thing. And actually, it's just something related to the uh, the previous paper on, on sort of networking. Now, being a deputy dean, I'm, I was particularly interested in, uh, you know, how networks uh, affect, um, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the political connections and where they are stronger and where they're weaker. And, and so in the, the previous paper, I'm, I'd be curious to know what the, what the University of Chicago uh, um, impact would be, because I think you, they uh, sussed out uh, Harvard, Stanford, and the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Well, look, look as, a, yeah, as a proud Chicago grad, I agree with you. I'd love to see it too. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much for well, great comments and the insights. Would, would you I like to? Would you like uh, to have a couple of minutes to come back with any thoughts, any first reactions to the comments, uh, Bo, or should we should we switch to the que question and answer session? Yeah, I think um, <laughs> all the um, comments um, we really appreciate. It offers a great insights. Yeah, so we can switch to the comments. Yeah. Okay, That's great. So I can see from the panel, uh, Pat has a question. He posted, but uh, Pat, would you like to verbally ask your question? Maybe a discussion would be better. Uh, sure. So I was just, so one thing that I think this literature generally struggles with is separating out enforcement from changing sort of underlying misbehavior. And uh, one thought that I had is perhaps you could use information on the start date of um, the misbehavior and, and to sort of rule out that there's cyclicality or sort of anticipation of electoral effects in when domestic and foreign firms are um, starting to engage in some of this, this corrupt behavior. 
And, you know, I think this would be a great falsification because that would help to rule out that it's on the firm side and it's really on, on the enforcement side. So you might be able to show non-cyclicality in that dimension. Yeah. And, and so Pat, I think that's a great idea. We'll definitely look into it. And so I think one of the neat parts of, of this data, like Bo mentioned, is that this is stuff that's happened like a really long time ago. And I think to your exact point, it's like, we imagine this and as like, there's a pool of these bribery cases, right? The, so the average amount of time is like eight to 10 years ago when this happened, but it goes all the way back to eight to 16. So you can imagine like whoever these actors are, they have a bunch of cases to choose from. And they're like looking through this pool that all happened a long time ago. And they're like, hey, which one of these do we want to choose out that we really might want to just nudge a little bit toward enforcement? Um, and we can look at that and not only the start date, but we can also look at the length of the enforcement. And we looked at that and it turns out getting to this idea of which cases they choose and how they choose to push them through. It looks like these are a bit weaker cases on average and that they're ones that the bribery happened over a shorter amount of time period, right? They have some cases to choose that were like going on for eight years, but the ones that they push here, because it's a limited sample they have to choose from, if we think that this electoral incentive is there, they end up choosing weaker cases in terms of their markers, empirical markers on average. But this is a great one to look at, and we'll look at as well. And, and so actually, just, just one, one follow-up thought I had here is if, if this, they're really picking sort of a different type of case, it could also be interesting to see if this plays out differently in the media, right? To look at sort of, is there yeah. more or less attention paid to some of these cases, in particular, given the potential harm that the DOJ is actually going after them for? Right, so is this yes. actually, in fact, a, a particular component of, of re-elections? Yes, yeah, no, it's a great suggestion. And so we show that they're empirically weaker, but it'd be great to see if the media somehow is, is yeah. involved here too. Thank you. Thanks, great question. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions from the, from the panel? If not, uh, there is one question, I think, from Stefan Castell from, uh, in the Q&A box. Um, if you guys may want to kind of react to that. Uh, I think it's a general question about like how effective this bribery actions, bri bribery enforcement actions on the, on the overall size of the bribery market. If uh, you may have any like first reactions to that question. Yeah, so look, I think it's a great question. It's tough for the reason that Pat just mentioned is that look, we wouldn't claim to observe the whole bribery market, right? Like we observe some selected sample of the enforcements against briberies. And I think that that makes it hard for us to estimate this. A really interesting question, but very tricky to estimate. Great. Uh, I think Anat had a question. Anat, do you have a question? Yeah, I have. Hi, I have a few questions, but some of them are just our clarification. So, um, in enforcement action, you mean that uh, that it was settled because there's just a lot of it takes a long time to negotiate these things. Uh, one question is, is it just DOJ or SEC? Because SEC, of course, Judiciary Committee does, is not relevant and SEC is like, you know, it's a different part of FCPA. So how did yeah. you do that? The other questions I yeah. had have to do with whistleblowers and other things, but I'll start with totally. that. Totally. No, no, you're hundred percent right. So we were thinking the same thing. We're like, gosh, they have oversight, but they only have oversight on part of this. So in some ways, that's actually an empirical prediction. So we actually then went and hand collected who brought the case initially. And they tell us that in the data, which is super cool. And so your intuition is completely right. These are all coming from DOJ cases. These, this bump up in cases is all coming from the DOJ. So consistent with exactly this. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Thanks for the question. With a whistleblower, uh, data was that relevant, uh, and, and if so, how? Uh, you know, in detection issues, because uh, uh, the detection must have happened a while before. Before yeah, the, well, the so an enforcement action, you mean that it was settled because there's a lot of time between the start, the initiation of the act of the action and the settlement. So when when you say action, you mean an actual closure, the, the resolution of the case. Yeah, both. Both. Do you want to take that? And the whistleblower okay. date as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there are different dates. So the first uh, from the case, we are able to observe when does a bribery activity uh, first take place. 
such as in the total case, all the way in the 1997. So then we are able to observe the date where the DOJ SEC started the case in the uh, investigation. So for example, like about 20 years ago, then we are going to quick, very quickly after one year or so, so, we are going to see a case resolution. So we are going to explore. So there will be huge time lag between the bribery action and the enforcement. So that's why we show in the one the, uh, the graph. So about average 80 years. And then we try, that's very good question on the whistleblower. We try to dig on the information. Uh, what uh, role has the whistleblowers? Uh, do they provide the information, that, et cetera, at the incentivize? Unfortunately, so I think uh, for public disclosure, it only says there is any blow, whistleblower, but we do not see any information. So they just put secret on that. So so ideally, we would like to explore. So which role did they play? So especially when enforcement actions against foreign companies. Are there whistleblower provisions for FCPA? The, uh, I mean, presumably, so the whistleblowers would be foreign citizens, and the, there is a provision at the DOJ for for them. I'm just not familiar with this part of uh, it. They will receive uh, uh, about thirty percent. So of the punishment. So, uh, okay, there so the, the usual, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's so, a reason. Uh, so that also explains why increases in the enforcement, they become more efficient with the better information either provided by their uh, foreign counterpart or by the all by the US competitors. So they would provide information, yeah. But just to be clear, when you say enforcement action, you know, the year before the election, you mean that the case was closed, not that uh, that that it was a settlement. That that the case was completely settled. We mean the I, case, just, not, just a terminology question. Okay, we mean the case was initiated. Initiated. So, yeah. so it's, yeah, oh. it's exactly yeah, yeah, it's what you would expect. Yeah. So in other words, that's when Cornyn bring. That's when Cornyn says, "Hey guys, this is the one we want to open. Let's open this. Let's put it out to the public." To Pat's point from before, like let me get a little bit of push from here so that everyone can see. Now, when they are eventually settled, and you're totally right, then we actually can look in and say, "Hey." Did these look like they were strong or weak cases? And to your okay. intuition, they look like weaker cases. They get less money. They get, you know, they take less time. It's okay. like all these look like weaker cases ex post. But ex post okay. could happen after the election. So they were started to kind of appease the politician, according to this. Yes. Story. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but but they were weak. Oh, that that means more political motivation. Got it. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for the question. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, I cannot see in the Q and A uh, box, uh, but if you might have any reactions from the from the panel, uh, maybe I can have one final question. As uh, you know, as the, as the chair, take advantage of my position again. Uh, so, uh, since since this is a contribution, essentially in a way to to this lending cycle literature as well, right? Like the effects of of uh, of the of the cycles, basically the election cycles, and there is that you know discussion in that literature where you know. Are these distortions in the timing of lending or the credit, whatever you may be looking at as a cycle, uh, is this a temporary distortion which kind of you know gets corrected later on, or it, does this create an accumulated impact at the end of the you know at the end of the day? Uh, uh, there is a bit of a debate in in, the, in that literature. I don't know if you guys kind of try to kind of uh, get 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 to an overall impact of of this. Actions. Yeah, and so, and so look, I think it's a fascinating question. So uh, we would love to get to the bottom of it. It's really hard to do, as, as you're suggesting. I'll tell you what we did. So we find that there is some real effect. We're starting to see some markers of a real effect in behavior. What do we mean by that? We mean firms, once action is brought against them, it looks like they're taking real actions. Like the firms don't just brush this off and be like, yeah, okay, it's going to be business as usual. We get this is just a political thing. So we're not going to change the way we do business. It looks like they do change and they do change in the following sense. They change the geographic, if you can think about this spatial econometric location of where they do business, right? So where they sell things and where they produce things. And so it looks like it is having an impact on them. And so in that sense, it looks like it's having an impact. And we're looking at how they respond in the years after, right? In about the three to four years after. Now, given our data and many of these actions happened like in the last six or seven years, you could be right, maybe 10 years from now, they go back to doing business in those same countries or even doing business in those same countries might mean something different as those countries change over time. So even that wouldn't be a thing that would be a reliable estimate in that sense. But I can tell you in the short run, this seems to have an impact that's not reversed. 
Okay, at least in the behavior of those firms. Now, look, is there a transfer to other firms that we're not measuring or something along these lines? For sure, that could be going on. But at least in the behavior of firms on which these actions are brought, it does seem to be having an effect on their real behavior. I see. Thank you very much, Lauren. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the discussion as well to Randy and for the presentation to, to Bo. I think we can have a slightly longer break for this time, uh, just to make up for the, for the slightly uh, shorter break in the, in the previous session. So we are going to start with uh, the second session. Again, in the beginning of the R, uh, Thornston will be uh, chairing that session, and it will be on the politics of international or national credit uh, with two papers. Uh, so we'll see you in 15 minutes. Thanks again. Okay, uh, welcome back. Um, it is almost five o'clock in uh, London, so I think we are ready to roll uh, for our next uh, exciting sessions with uh, two papers uh, on the politics of first international and then of national credits. Um, I think it was Orkin who came up with these session titles. They're really nice. Um, anyway, so uh, before I get started, let me just very briefly remind you that um, uh, the uh, terms of um, uh, engagements. Um, so for uh, 30 minutes for the, uh, for the presenter, 10 minutes for the discussant. And uh, during presentation discussion, if panelists want to uh, have a question, then they can just write it in the uh, chat or they can also raise their hand like I did earlier. Uh, to speak. Um, please, if you ask a question in the chat, uh, make sure to address it to both panelists and attendants so everybody can see it. 
Attendees can send their questions through the Q&A box and should only use the, um, the chat for technical questions. So the first paper, and I think it's Larissa who will present it. Uh, I think Elizabeth is also on the call, but uh, she will probably take questions. Um, does political partnership uh, cross borders? Evidence from international capital flows. Larissa, it's all yours. Okay, can you hear me well? Okay, now I cannot hear you, Thorsten, but uh, I think you can. Oh, hear yes, me. Uh, you can see the slide, you can <laughs> okay, hear okay. you, you're ready Perfect. to go. Sorry, that was okay. a little bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. So, um, so thanks a lot for the invitation to present this paper at the conference. We are very excited to present it because it's, we are working on our first draft. So very happy to hear our com your comments from panelists, attendee, and especially for Maria Sunta. Um, so this is uh, a paper on political polarization and cross-border capital flows. And this is joint work with Elizabeth Kemp, who's also in the audience, and uh, Mansi Lu, uh, Luo, who's also in the audience uh, around the attendees. And they will be answering the Q&A questions um, in the chat room. And uh, also with Margarita Tsutsur. So let me jump right into it. If it does work. OK. So, um, there's been a growing uh, partisan divide in the US for the past 20 years. And what do I mean by partisan divide? That uh, members of different parties do not just disagree on factual issues, but also have a general distrust and dislike uh, towards each other. And this goes as far uh, as uh, this paper by Inger and Alfox from 2012, showing that 50% of Republicans and 30% of Democrats uh, in 2012 would dislike if their daughter or son would marry someone from the opposite party, uh, while this number was only at 5% in 1960s. There's also evidence showing that voters have an increased tendency to view the economy through a partisan perception screen, meaning their uh, views or expectations of how the economy will evolve depend on whether the White House is occupied by the party they are supporting. So for example, if you're a Republican and Trump is in power, you're more optimistic that the economy is going to do well um, relative to when you are Democrat and Trump is in power. This house also has, um, Recent evidence has also shown that this partisan perception, we call it, um, to affect the economic behavior of US individuals in the US. And not only does it affect the behavior of households, but also of professional investors, such as credit rating analysts and loan officers. So while the evidence on um, households is sort of mixed, so especially the evidence on consumption, on portfolio choice, there's some recent evidence by um, Antoinette Schwa and co-authors where they show that, for example, uh, Republicans are more likely to invest, uh, reshuffle their portfolio towards um, equity and high beta stocks after the election of Trump relative to Democrats. And uh, also the work by my co-authors, Elizabeth and Margarita, showing that credit rating analysts are more likely to downgrade firms um, when they're misaligned with the party in power. Meaning, for example, if you're a Democrat, and Trump is in power, you're more likely to downgrade firms independent of the firm characteristics. But as you can see, most of this evidence so far has been focused on US individuals in the US, and there's no evidence basically outside of the US, and this is where our paper comes in. And we ask the question whether partisanship affects cross-border investments. And in particular, actually, we ask two questions. First, we're interested to see whether US investors are as polarized uh, about foreign investments as they are sort of or foreign politics as they are uh, around domestic issues that has already been shown. And secondly, we're also interested to see whether we see any effects of non-US investors uh, investing basically abroad in, inter in, in the international context. So why is it uh, generally interesting to answer this question? Because we think cross-border inv investment is important for international firms in terms of investment and growth. And also this question is not that obvious to answer for two reasons. So first that um, there's a long tradition or belief also in the US that partisan politics should stop at the water's edge, meaning that uh, when it comes to um, foreign politics and national security issues, uh, the US should have a national stance and, all, and have their political polarization and their political issues only when it comes to domestic politics. And this has been famously put also by US Senator Arthur Vandenberg in 1947 on the onset of the Cold War, War where he said that partisan politics uh, should stop at the water's edge. So it is per se not obvious whether uh, in the US would care about foreign politics. 
And secondly, also there's recent evidence on um, political polarization also outside the US by Gensko, Foxell and Shapiro showing that there is political polarization also outside uh, of the US, for example, in Australia, uh, Switzerland, I think you look at Canada, but it is not as salient feature as it is in the US. So it is not per se obvious uh, whether we should find anything at all. And we look here in particular in two settings. We look at the syndicated loan market and equity mutual funds because both of them had several advantages. So we think both of them uh, using these two markets, we can um, capture a large part of cross-border lending and equity investments. So for example, the syndicated loan market, it captures around three quarter of uh, international lending to non-financial uh, firms, which is quite big. And similarly, uh, US equity mutual funds invest around uh, three trillion dollars abroad, which is a uh, total net assets, which is also a very sizable amount. And interesting for us, of course, because we want to have micro level data, um, we can observe capital flows at individual investor level. So for the bank and the mutual fund manager or the mutual fund team, and we can uh, relate it to their party affiliation or uh, using party records or political contributions. And what we can do in the end, we can look at capital allocation by parties investors in the same destination country around the same foreign elections. And I'll be clear, so as I already said, we're focused more on US. So let me make an example. What I mean by that is imagine we have um, Republican and Democratic uh, investors investing in France around the election of Macron. Yeah, so when there was a switch from uh, Hollande to Macron, so from more left, to a more right-wing party, and we want to see how this change, this continuous change in political uh, ideology or distance, political distance to these um, to this party in power in France affects the investment behavior of Democrats versus Republicans. And so I'll be more specific afterwards, but basically, Democrats become further away, Republicans become closer to a more uh, right-wing party. So we would expect uh, Republicans to uh, increase the investment. And this is exactly what we find. We find for banks that banks reduce lending where they experience an increase in ideological distance after foreign elections. So in my example, democratic banks uh, would be more likely to reduce uh, lending uh, to France after the election of uh, Macron relative to Republican investors or uh, Republican banks. And then also what we look at afterwards is um, we find some tentative evidence that banks charge higher spreads, especially when they're uh, relationship banks, uh, but do, they do not face higher defaults, suggesting that it is not driven by differences in uh, a borrower base. Um, then when we look at equity mutual funds, we see a similar effect that mutual funds, here we'll look at the uh, portfolio location share because this is more common for mutual funds. We see that they also decrease their portfolio and their allocation when the distance increases. Um, Similarly here, we do not find uh, any de uh, differences in fund performance uh, of the one uh, de Democrats versus Republicans, for example, in my, exa uh, in my example. And lastly, and this is very new evidence, I'm very excited about that because as you might imagine, there's literally no data on uh, political contributions out there, outside of the US, but we were able to get some data and we find actually some similar uh, effects for non-US investors. So we have some international evidence for banks and mutual funds. And also we find some evidence on aggregate level. So political affiliation between different countries. I will be a bit short uh, on the contribution or contribution in the interest of time, although I notice I have more time. So there is, um, there are papers, as I already mentioned, that look at, of the, at the response of parties and investors around domestic political events. And our contribution here is basically we'll look at foreign for, um, political events, so foreign national elections, and we want to see how uh, partisan perception affects international investments. There's also evidence on political affiliation investor behavior in general. So, for example, Hong and Kostovetsky showing that um, Democrats are more likely to invest in so, uh, social responsible stock. And there's also um, evidence on the terms of cross border capital flows. Uh, Maria Sunt has a paper um, and on both home buys and uh, cultural distances and syndicated lending, how it affects lending. So here we're contributing by showing an additional factor that might affect cross border capital flows. How do we measure political ideology and what we actually mean by this alignment of different uh, of the investors with the party in power in the country? So we use two things. 
And this already shows you what is sort of the advantage and disadvantage of both data sets. So for US banks, uh, we primarily, although we have other data, we use priority affiliation based on political contributions of the political action committee. So basically we see uh, if you contributed in the past years mostly to Republican Party, so more than 50% of your contributions were towards the Republican Party, you will be seen as a Republican bank. And then <clears throat> the nice thing about the US, uh, US fund managers here, we can use actually US voter registration records <clears throat> where we know the party, the actually party affiliation of the mutual fund manager or all the mutual, mutual fund managers in the team. So we can richly say for each point in time, which party he belongs to. <coughs> and then, excuse me, um, the second uh, piece of um, data that we use is we use a um, ideological score from the manifesto project, which is a political science measure that measures policy positions of political parties on the left and right scale. Basically, they take electoral, electoral manifestos of um, party in each point in time, and then they uh, look at different sentences and basically say, is this party more left or right wing? So we just, we do not do the simple thing, okay, there's Republican, Democrat, is left or right, we have an actual measure for that. And then using the affiliation, the party affiliation of our um, investors, banks or fund managers, we can create an ideological distance between the party of investor I and the party in power in country C at each point in time. So in our case, in France, you would have the distance, the uh, absolute distance between the um, democratic investor, or democratic bank relative to the party in power in France. Uh, and then at the same time, um, Republican investor relative to the party in power in France. Let's have a look how it looks like uh, on, um, on the map. So here we see uh, the distance of US investors, here democratic investors relative to foreign governments in 2017, where uh, when you see that the higher the distance, the further away they ideologically from the party in power. And you see naturally what you might see is that they're close in 2017 to Canada, where Justin Trudeau was in power, which was a democratic party. We see also they're closer to Scandinavian countries, also here to Ireland and UK. So something that you would typically uh, expect. And of course, if you look at, and they're actually far away from Switzerland that had a very right wing government at, at that point in time. So when you look at Democrats, it looks much darker. Um, and here you see they're further away from um, Swedish, so Nordic, Sweden, Nor Norway, so um, more left wing governments, also from Latin America. But if you see they're closer to Switzerland and Hungary that are sort of more right wing. So it suggests us that it, it, it really captures the distances that you might also have in your head intuitively between these different countries. And this measure also varies over time because basically we have each point in time uh, for each election, we have a new sort of political ideological measure for each party. Uh, for the, our investment data, we use two data, standard databases. So on the one hand, the Thomson Reuters deal scan database for syndicated loans, where we focus on 20,000 cross-border deals to 4,000 non-financial borrowers from 46 foreign destination countries by uh, issued by 28 US banks. Yeah, so um, as you might know, US banks are also very active in this international syndicated loan market and capture a big part of, uh, of it. And it actually, uh, we are still capturing also 80% of all cross-border lending by US banks. And notice we look here at loan issuance is in case you're not familiar with this database, this only looks at loan issuances. So not outstanding loan amount. And then the second database we use is facts and international ownership data uh, base combined with Morningstar direct uh, on active uh, all open-ended mutual funds between 2000 and 2008. So we, we have the same time period. And this is around 385 US international funds. So we look just at the national funds here, uh, which whose style is to be international basically. We, we capture around 200 fund managers investing in 24 uh, foreign destination countries, which captures around 34 of total net assets of US international equity. And here you see this, um, um, it is a bit smaller, but we have um, due to the fact that we have to use voter research and records and it is a very tedious process uh, to get basically the names uh, of the people and match them to voter registration records and you do not capture everyone. So what do we expect? So we expect that 
um, ideologically close investors are biased in both directions. So either they are more positive, they have more positive expectations with, uh, with respect to profitability of the investment if they are closer to the party in power. And on the other hand, they'll be more pessimistic if they're further away from the party in power. So for banks, it would mean, for example, that a closer bank might underestimate the likelihood of borrow default, implying that the return uh, on the loan will be higher, whereas a more distant bank will overestimate the return on uh, the likelihood of borrow default and thus basically estimate a lower return on the loan, independent of uh, the quality of the borrow. And as a result, uh, we would expect that distant banks would lend less relative to closed banks, and at the same time, we'll expect them to charge higher spreads because they are overestimate for a default, but we should not find more differences in default. Uh, how do we identify this? Um, now we'll be more specific about these foreign elections and what we're doing. So we have faced several challenges here. Um, as I already mentioned, there's a big literature also on other bilateral measures um, affecting um, and international investments or cross-border lending. So um, they're likely correlating with also with ideological distance. And more importantly also, uh, what we have to control for is that, for example, if a left-wing government is elected, there'll be more certainty about expected uh, investment returns, or for example, there might be changes in favorability uh, of treatment between the uh, US, for example, and other parties. So we have to control for this somehow. So what do we do here? Uh, again, as I already said, we we'll look at the capital allocation by partisan investors, the same destination country, same foreign election, and the same point in time. So let me show it in a picture. So again, I'm using the French election, and I know some uh, the next presenter is French, so she will correct me if I'm completely mistaken here. <laughs> so um, we look at the. Um, for example, let's have, have a look at the Republican bank and, and the Democratic bank from the US uh, extending loans to French firm or to France generally around the election of 2007. And before there was the party of um, Hollande, which was social Juridique, which was more on the left. And then after um, the, uh, not the presidential, but the parliamentary election, we see that the party of Macron, La République en Marche, is the winning one, which is sort of center, center right. Uh, wing party. So what we see here um, is that before the election, Bank D is closer to the party, in, uh, ideologically closer to the party in power relative to um, Bank R. And then after um, the election, Bank D is ideologically more distant relative to the center party. And this exactly captures what we're doing. So basically, we're comparing these two investors pre and post elections. So one, ex so the democratic one experiences in distance increase. And uh, the Republican one experienced a distance decrease. So we'll compare the one that have a distance increase relative to the one that have a distance uh, decrease in uh, before and after the election. And we could we'll look at it at each point in time. So thus, we can also control for these expected returns uh, affecting um, our results. And nicely, what we can do by looking at elections is that we have discontinuous changes to ideological distance of these two investors that are not coming from them, but coming from the foreign election. How does it look like in a regression? Basically, we have an investment by investor I, Republic Democrat, in my example, to France. So we look at France total investment to France, not just France, France in half year T around election E. So we have four half years before, so two years before and two years after. And then we put distance increase in our case for Democratic banks and distance increase for the Republican. And we have a post dummy. And here are the fixed effect that basically control for all these things that I've been mentioning. So on the one end, we have. Um, the most important effect, which is election, so French election, so not, not just French in uh, France in a certain point in time, but actually we'll look around the French election in each point in time. Yeah, so this is election France, uh, so certain election France, so Macron's election France in each point in time. And then also we have this bilateral controls or fixed effects where we have the same investors, so Republican and Democrat, and his connection to or relationship to France in each election. So not just in France in general, but actually in each election. This is how it looks like. So we experience, we see that uh, around event time, so here we decompose our post and pre uh, dummies. We, leak, we see, look here at loan volume and see that after um, the election, so for the Democratic Party in our example, we see a drop in lending uh, when 
um, the bank experiences ideological distance increase. And it's quite sizable. And if we would put an average uh, line here, you would see that it's actually a large drop, which is, seems to be also persistent uh, for a couple of uh, half years. And then if we look at um, the regression. So here we add, uh, in, um, this is a bank destination country time level. So we add first election time times and bank time selection fixed effects. So in our case, investors the bank. And we see uh, in our preferred specification, a uh, drop in lending volume of around 32% when the distance increases. And we do a couple of robustness that I will not show, but I mean, I can show you later on if there are questions. So we also introduce bank controls. We also introduce bank time time fixed effect. Uh, we also look at different measures because as yes, you might imagine political uh, connection, um, political contributions are not the best measure. So we have political contributions, uh, sorry, political, uh, voting records of the CEOs. So we see also an effect where we actually take the bank CEOs, though the effect is a bit diminished because it's not clear cut who is taking the decisions in the bank. So we also find effects there. And also on the number of loans, there we have a 10% decrease, so a bit smaller in terms of size. Um, and then we expect the effects to be strong for close elections. Uh, because we think the adjustment will be stronger if the election is less expected. And this is exactly what we're finding. So for close elections, the effect, the effect is stronger and statistically different for non-close elections. Um, then we look at spreads. And here we look at bank firm loan time level because we, we have to observe spreads and we don't want to average them. And of course, the number of observation reduces here then. Um, so we have, um, again, our post and distance dummy web from bank loan controls, rating scale, uh, firm cluster. So we look basically within the same uh, industry, uh, within the same rating category, uh, around the same election and point in time. Yeah, so we control this for everything that we can. And we find here the effect is marginally significant around uh, seven percentage points. Uh, yeah, which corresponds to 14 basis points higher spreads, but this effect becomes stronger if we interact with the relationship dummy, meaning once they have market power, um, they um, have um, they charge higher spreads. So per se, it's not clear cut whether they should charge higher spreads or not. So we think this effect is quite nice. And what we care a lot here also about is that uh, in terms of default, we do not find statistically different uh, uh, statistical differences between the um, banks that experience a distance increase relative to the one that experienced a distance decrease. And we find a similar effect also for downgrades. Uh, now, when we look at equity mutual funds, we see a similar pattern, although it is sort of more smooth, but this is mostly due to the fact that um, there's more cyclicality and syndicated loan lending. So we find also that funds reduce their excess portfolio share when the distance increases. Here, the uh, economic effect uh, is slightly smaller. So we see that um, we, we have a dependent firm excess weight. So the weight of this uh, fund in a certain investment style in excess of um, other, uh, other funds with the same investment style in this country. So what on top do they invest uh, in this country relative to the others? It's a common measure in a mutual fund. So here we see a 23 basis points reduction in our preferred specification. We have also election time times and now fund time selection fixed effects. Uh, when um, the distance of the fund um, increases, and this corresponds to 5% relative to the average weight portfolio share. And interestingly here, uh, what we find is you might be wondering that effects might be driven also by political connections. So as I already mentioned, there are papers showing that uh, political parties are favoring certain industries, let's say Republicans uh, favoring more oil companies and now left-wing government is elected. So now basically they're shining away because now they they, they, they ties with the, um, these oil companies will be sort of torn down because they will be facing more restrictions in their own home country. And this we can control for nicely in the setting also of mutual funds, we can actually look um, within the same stock and within the same election and time. So we can look basically two funds, one Republican, one Democratic, investing around the French election in the same company, let's say the same oil company, and still we would see that they would retract from the same company. So it's not driven by um, comp uh, compositions, um, different firm compositions that um, our different funds are facing. 
Yeah, so here, of course, the number of reservations is huge because it's on stock level, but this is the sort of advantage of the fund setting, which we can do the banking setting, but not as light, nicely, of course. And uh, interestingly, also, you might uh, wonder, yeah, um, this might be driven also by other characteristics, uh, not just political connections. And I also very really like, much like this result. We'll also show um, that it is not driven by other uh, characteristics of the fund managers, where we, which we can do here, like gender, uh, age, tenure that are also likely to be correlated with your political affiliation. Then we also find that there's no effect on uh, fund performance or so total fund performance here. Uh, we look at benchmark adjusted return and economic value added using different benchmarks like um, the market uh, or ETF passive funds or uh, local funds. And we find no difference in the return. We find some negative uh, result for academic value added. Economically, it's there, but uh, statistically, it's not significant. And coming to uh, our news and uh, exciting, also very exciting results. Um, um, here we um, find similar effects for non-US investor. Here we're looking at Canada and UK. And here we have basically for, uh, for banks, we look at volume and for mutual funds, we look at excess weight. Uh, and here we introduce election times time fix effect, home country times selection, home country times time war. So we control that we have two different home countries, UK and Canada. So we control for difference in these countries. And you see for the banks, there is a tendency. So the effect is there, but uh, it is not very strongly significant. Economically, it is there. For mutual fund, it is very large. So it was five, now 15. Um, notice basically here, of course, our sample is slightly more selected than before because it's very hard to find any political contributions data. And here it is um, political contributions of uh, fund managers. So it is a slightly selected sample. That's why we suspect that the results might be a bit stronger, but we were very excited to find uh, any results at all. So we find that also non-US investment reduce uh, the investments when the distance increases around foreign elections. And lastly, um, you might wonder uh, whether it's an effect basically that those two things canceling each other out, which is of course not the case because it's not like you have 50% Republicans and 50% Democratic fund managers. So if you see a retraction uh, in um, capital flows, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, basically they cancel each other out and there's no retraction. So we look at aggregate levels, in this case, FDI flows. Here we cannot look around elections. Here basically we just look at the ideological alignment, for example, right now of Biden with Macron right now on how it was before when there was Trump relative to Macron. So we look at the parties in power in the respective countries. And here we can measure at an aggregate level uh, how the effects of um, partisanship or distance in ideological alignment transcend. And we find that a one standard deviation larger distance uh, is associated with 0.86 percentage points lower FDI flows, which implies uh, basically a 7% decrease relative to the average FDI flow, which we think is also a sizable effect. So also here, notice also FDI flows are something completely different than what we looked before, which was more foreign direct portfolio investments. So these are other types of flows here. And we find also an effect on the aggregate level. So now I have even more time than I thought. I'm not used to have no questions during my presentation. So, um, so what I'm trying to convince you is uh, to show that partisan perception does transcend national borders. We find evidence both for syndicated low markets and equity mutual funds. But uh, most importantly, also, we find that um, the economic effects of partisanship are not limited just to US investors, but also in, they seem to matter for non-US investors. So we think there's an important role of partisan perception shaping international capital flows. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Larissa, also for staying in time again. Um, and now over to Maria Sunta, who is uh, our discussant. Thank you for having me. So let me share my slides. So that's the, you see everything, right? Okay, so thank you for uh, inviting me to um, discuss uh, this uh, interesting paper. I will just start with uh, a small step back. And uh, let, um, so saying that uh, this paper contributes uh, an interesting uh, new tussle to a huge literature that has been trying to understand uh, the drivers of uh, 
domestic and international investment, uh, probably fueled by the Lucas paradox. Uh, people have been uh, showing that uh, capital flows and uh, portfolio choices are not only driven by uh, risk and returns, but uh, that investors care about uh, a lot of other characteristics uh, of the assets and the countries in which they invest. So I would uh, classify these characteristics uh, as uh, homophily investing in uh, assets or uh, countries that uh, better reflect uh, uh, one's own culture or values and uh, awareness that is mostly driven by uh, uh, informational exchange and so on. So I would think that for the current paper that uh, looks um, at the international capital flows, issues related to information exchange and media coverage are important. And um, as uh, Larissa told us, they look at uh, a new um, aspect uh, that is uh, partisanship, but uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, related uh, political factors that uh, have been discussed in the literature as uh, determinants of uh, capital flows. So for instance, uh, patriotism and uh, bilateral, bilateral uh, relationship. And uh, if you uh, Google uh, bilateral relationship, uh, are very, um, there is a lot of discussion in uh, the literature. And not in the academic literature, but uh, uh, policy wise. So um, partisanship here uh, is, uh, in my opinion, uh, an aspect of uh, homophily. And uh, years ago, with Ishayafe, we looked at the cultural differences uh, as uh, a driver of uh, um, in international syndicated bank loans and uh, their costs. Looking at partisanship here, also from, uh, first of all, partisanship is important because it's an important component of uh, an ind individual level identity. So it is uh, for sure worth studying. But uh, in the context of, uh, um, in an international setting, I think that is also particularly interesting because it allows a better measurement and identification. When we try to classify culture, of course, we have to take a stand on what is important and what is not, what classification is more salient or not, while there is no doubt on what is a political affiliation, what it means to be a liberal. And on top of this, as Larissa showed us, political identity is more an individual characteristic, not a country characteristic. So we can do a lot of within country analysis. So in this context, the paper shows that political partisanship matters for international syndicated loan issuance, mutual fund investment, and then the some robustness for FDI. So let's go back to, uh, so this is a very early uh, paper. So I, I would think that in order to uh, enhance the analysis and the discussion of the test, it would be nice to have uh, a main alternative explanation. And uh, on the basis of some fast Google search, I would think that the main and more interesting alternative explanation that uh, looking at partisanship we can bring to the literature is a bilateral relationship. And for instance, this, um, the, um, this is from, uh, I think I know uh, the OECD website in which basically is discussed how bilater good bilateral relationship lead to more uh, convergence in um, regulations, more treaties, and might lead to more investment. This is what basically this report from the OECD is, is saying. Okay, so is, it would be nice to develop the test in a way that we can understand what we learn more than bilateral relationship. So 
in general, what we could think is that if a bilateral relationship are, in, are improving for a part of the investors from a given country, this political distance is increasing. So nationalistic investors might be more likely to invest and to, to increase their investment. But the partisanship is different, even if uh, a country uh, becomes a more right wing and uh, Republican under Trump are very happy and the bilateral relationship improve, there will be some uh, Democrats that are uh, disgruntled. Okay. So from an econometric point of view, and what Larissa and co-authors are kind of uh, exploiting now is uh, precisely this uh, within a country difference within the US. And uh, in my opinion, it would be nice to go beyond the identification and uh, to try to develop some more economically recent tests. So for instance, I am wondering, I'm curious uh, of how the color of the US administration affects the response. Larissa started her presentation discussing how political partisanship and the color of the US administration affects uh, households and the professionals expectation on a future economic performance. So it might well be that the Democrats uh, during uh, Republican administrations uh, have a much higher expectation on uh, the returns of uh, assets in uh, more politically aligned uh, countries. So I am wondering if investor, this bias is more pronounced when investors that are not happy at home read more foreign press and more foreign news and invest to a larger extent abroad. So I am wondering how difficult it would be to bring a bit more uh, about information also about uh, news coverage of uh, the uh, foreign country. I would think if that here, if we are capturing an homophilistic bias, this would be more pronounced if there is a relatively more media coverage of the, uh, those particular destination countries. But uh, I would uh, really look also at, uh, the po at, uh, at the different point in time and how the uh, domestic administration affect this uh, um, bias. Let me uh, look at um, the empirical models. I have uh, some uh, questions uh, and uh, mostly driven by the fact that uh, this is uh, probably I was uh, the first reader of the draft. So basically Larissa is uh, using the same uh, empirical model to look at um, uh, loan issuance uh, and uh, to look at uh, the portfolio shares uh, are properly adjusted uh, of uh, mutual funds. And uh, to some, uh, but uh, these empirical models in uh, these uh, two contests, uh, for me, says uh, something that is uh, very different. For instance, I was very surprised that for uh, the mutual funds uh, portfolio shares, we are seeing just a temporary effect. Meaning that, okay, there is an election. This is a, um, my expectation on stock returns in the foreign country change because now I, uh, I believe more in those uh, government policies. And uh, the mutual fund managers re uh, reallocate its portfolio. I don't know why this uh, portfolio reallocation uh, is there uh, only for uh, uh, one or two years. So do we, um, is this um, driven by the fact that at some point even the Democrats realize that uh, this uh, uh, more aligned government is not uh, as good as previously thought? Is this uh, a temporary or uh, a permanent effect? 
It may work a little better for loan issuance. Why? Well, th that is a flaw. So it might be that at some point, the exposure of the bank to that particular country becomes too high and the bank wants to uh, reallocate the loan portfolio. But uh, even there, we want to understand why this is a temporary effect. We want to understand what happens to uh, the coefficient beta if instead we consider that uh, these uh, investors, banks uh, and mutual funds uh, always invest in countries that are relatively more politically aligned. All right, can we two or three, so, two or three more minutes, please? Okay, right. I, I am almost done. The other question that I have is regarding the definition of treatment, meaning that uh, um, the distance, uh, this political distance, uh, is uh, basically um, a variable that has uh, um, a six values. Okay, so it's not continuous, but uh, it's not a dichotomic variable. And uh, since uh, currently the authors, uh, and uh, this I understood during the presentation, are doing uh, everything within election, okay. They are always comparing uh, a treatment that is uh, uh, a decreased distance, but uh, with also something else that uh, is changing, that is uh, the distance has increased, okay? So these, uh, to some extent, uh, since uh, there is nothing that is constant, uh, might lead us uh, to overstate uh, the economic effect of this, because we are comparing some investors who are happier are increasing their portfolio shares with others that uh, are decreasing it. I'm wondering if we really need all those fixed effects and if we really need to do everything within election. What I would like to have is some control sample in which there is, uh, there are other countries in which currently there is no election and in which there is uh, uh, this political distance is currently constant. So we could see whether there is uh, some uh, general portfolio reallocation or, or, uh, or not. It would be also nice uh, to see whether there is an asymmetry in uh, between a decrease uh, and an increase uh, in uh, distance. So um, let me just wrap up. Wrap up. I think the paper is uh, exploring uh, an interesting topic. For sure, political partisanship is uh, an important component of personal identity, affects how we interact with people. So I think that is uh, important to study it also in an uh, international context. And my comments are just to use this content with domestic political color to further develop the effect of partisanship in an international context in a way in which it cannot be done in a purely domestic paper and to clarify, sharpen the empirical framework, perhaps taking out some fixed effects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Sunta. Um... This was a very rich set of comments, but before I give it back to uh, Larissa, Elizabeth, and Mandy, Mency, sorry, apologies, um, maybe let me add some questions from my side, and then there are also some uh, questions in the chat that Elizabeth uh, offered to uh, answer live. Um, so a question that I had is, um, uh, no, I'm not really familiar with these, uh, the, um, what's it called, the uh, manifesto uh, project, um, but some many, many years ago, I did some work on uh, trying to classify um, governments as left-wing or right-wing. Um, but so I'm just wondering, um, I mean, until 2016 or 15, it was pretty clear who was right and who was left, but um, isn't there now an additional dimension with uh, Donald Trump uh, appearing or Brexit in the, in the UK? I mean, uh, the Republic, I mean, there are kind of old Republicans and then there are Trump Republicans, right? Um, and similarly, there are kind of old school Tories and then there are Brexit Tories. and. Uh, uh, I mean, it might, the difference might not seem as big, but I think there could be um, because uh, it's, uh, n n there's one, the economic uh, po uh, policy, or, but then there's also this kind of more leadership ideology, right? And uh, so one thing you could argue why uh, Republicans see themselves as closer to Macron is that actually Macron tried to reach out to Trump 
Although from other points, as somebody pointed out in the chat, actually, I mean, they're completely different, I would argue. I mean, uh, Macron is a European. Uh, I mean, I still remember the, he played the, uh, the European uh, anthem and not the French anthem at his uh, victory party, uh, which is completely opposite to, uh, to Donald Trump, right? So I'm just wondering, I mean, that's not a criticism, but it's just wondering how you deal with this change uh, in kind of ideological uh, orientation also within the Republican Party uh, in the in the U.S. Maybe you have to split the sample. I don't know. Uh, and then actually related to that, um, would be actually a second test that you can do is not to look at elections um, since it's something that I, I'm mispronouncing this name. I apologize. Kok An uh, 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 pointed out in the in the in the in the chat. Um, the uh, people have to get used to a new leader. I mean, Macron was really kind of an unwritten paper, right? And would it be possible, I mean, kind of taking it uh, to an extreme, tweets by Donald Trump about foreign leaders, would that matter? Would you see any effect there on the behavior, for example, especially on Republican uh, investors or banks, um, if you might call them so, um, compared to the control group of the Democratic uh, ones? Um, and the final comment that I have is in the uh, time-honored tradition of alternative explanations. Um, and again, this is devil's advocate. Um, Assume that Republican and Democratic investors invest in different types of um, industries and um, then the, let's say, a new government in uh, France, Germany, wherever, uh, favors one set of industries over another set of industries. And that might align with the uh, kind of uh, industry set by either Republican or Democrat. Might, it's, might still um, be consistent with your story of ideology, but there might be another kind of... Uh, underlying uh, um, uh, story behind it, or maybe it's a channel that uh, I would say. Um, so these are my three questions. And now um, just to kind of follow up. So um, uh, Kok An, and I'm, again, my apologies for mispronouncing your name. Um, he kind of points to the fact that um, the uh, that uh, Macron's, uh, um, what is it called, uh, LRM or his party might actually be closer to Democrats, um, but it might also be that there was a degree of uncertainty when he came in. Um, and then the second question by, oh, I got what the question, the second question is. Um, yeah, there was a second question that uh, Elizabeth wanted to, uh, to, uh, to, to answer in uh, live. So let me maybe turn over to you, whoever wants to go first, Larissa, Elizabeth, Mansi, and uh, try to answer these questions. Thanks. Okay, so first of all, thanks a lot, Maya Sunta, for your comments. I think they're all very valid and very important to answer. And actually, we were just discussing your. A suggestion of having the media coverage for elections. I think it's a very important thing that we should do. Um, and then coming to the other um, points that you raised, um, I think the long-term effects, yeah, I mean, we were struggling a lot in the beginning to combine these two settings and you're right that we're looking at uh, flow and stock. And we had actually some results, but right now we're not very clear or we do not say anything about it. We see sort of so more long-term effects for banks. So if we would expand it to three years, we see that the effect persists also for banks for longer. So I think it's not just lucky um, firms that just win it, but I think we should mention it more clearly in the paper. And I think also in terms of uh, other countries and this effects, I mean, it's totally clear, I think that we're comparing two uh, very, um, both people that are basically um, um, biased in both direction, right and left. So we do not have a control group that is sort of unbiased. And it's very hard, I think, for us to make a stance who is biased more to which direction and why. Um, yeah, and I think definitely we should mention that that's why maybe our result is also big because it's two sort of uh, samples that are relatively um, biased. And yeah, I should talk to my uh, colleague Be uh, Tobias Berg about, <laughs> about uh, we should mention about basically um, the treatment effects and the spillovers that might be coming up there. And to Thorsten, uh, I'm trying to do it with a notepad. Um, yeah, I think this manifesto project, as far as I understand, but maybe Mansi has a better comment on that. I think we would capture the old school sort of and the Brexit Tories because we do capture actually the not just the party, but it's changing over time. So we would oh. capture this different type of political electoral program of Trump or for example, of the new Tories, mm -hmm. let's say un, uh, under uh, Boris Johnson, I think we would capture this type of, right, Mency? This type of uh, different mm -hmm. type of. Maybe I can add something here. So essentially we don't take a stand on 
whether the party is left or right. Essentially, we just said whether it is closer to Republican compared to Democrat. So let's say McConnell is European, maybe in Europeans view, like he is, he is supposed to be left. Well, we just say like he is more closer to Republican than uh, Democrat. So it's like, we do not take a clear cut, say, okay, this is right and this is left. We always compare the distance to Democrats relative people. to each other. I mean, of each course, other. I mean, the, the, the normal- Can I tell you something? Because uh, these are the caught also my attention and then I replied myself. Macron is closer to the Republicans than Hollande. Oh. Yes. Okay, so yeah, yeah. And that is true because I was saying uh, when I first read this, okay. I, mm, I was starting from there, but then I would say, well, no, it was Orlando before that was worse for the Republicans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. it is the change, yeah. I think. Yeah, of yeah. course, yeah. Exactly. Democrats on average, of course, are not as left as uh, parties, uh, I mean, as left as Hollande, right? So, I mean, yeah. but still, be Hollande being super left, I, I think no Noemi would, should, should comment on that being French. We <laughs> So, we yeah. think that. Uh, Hollande is still sort of super left, so for Trump it would be super oh. far away. So when he when there's the switch, I think there's basically a decrease for Trump, and for Democrats there's an increase because of course, I mean, relative to Hollande, um, Macron is much more center right. Mm. Um, so on this point, um, since I asked it, um, can I yeah, clarify yeah, I the, the question a little bit more? So so I agree about the differential changes here, but. Uh, I think what matters here is the, the source of the variation. So suppose you have two banks, like one on the left. Well, this is my left. Anyway, one, one on the left, yeah, one yeah, on yeah, the right. Yeah. And um, so the variation, so the identification comes from a very clear variation. If you have some politicians or, you know, some countries, uh, parties changing in the middle of the two. So you have like a change in which one distance increases and the other, in the, the other distance decreases. Now, in the particular example of Macron, well, what happens with French politics and, and French um, economic policies is that all of that is way to the left of what we see in the US. Mm. And so what you have is a movement from, you know, the far left, not like communist left, but still far left, socialist left, to uh, Macron's, which is central uh, in France, but still to the left, I think, of uh, even the Democrats uh, in the US. So if you write it down in the regression equation, um, the identification comes from the change in uh, the distance, but not really from the change in the direction. So, um, you know, you write it as a linear equation and you may identify it based on this linearity of the effects, but mm. you know, it's, it could depend in a nonlinear way on this kind of distance, you know, we don't really know whether moving from distance two to one matters more or less than moving from distance uh, four to five. And that, that we don't really know. So in that sense, I think it's, um, it's an example that misses your key identification a little bit. And I'm sure that in, this, in the data, there could be plenty of other examples in which you really see this movement in between that, you know, there are people who move in, well, especially if you, if you take, I don't know, like UK politics, you, you see a lot more of that than, than uh, in French politics. Okay, let me just, thank before you. we, uh, before we get carried away, thank you very much uh, for this. Um, thank I you. Actually, not, no, um, Noemi also wrote in the chat, and I can, um, that this is actually indeed true that uh, all uh, uh, politics in Europe is uh, to the left of uh, most politics in, uh, in the US. And uh, being a European who has lived for many years, who lived for many years in the US, I can also confirm that. So I want to uh, just get to one more question, which I finally found, and I think Elizabeth wanted to answer that in the Q&A box uh, from Arcodipta. Um, shouldn't the necessary condition of a partisan behavior be that investors uh, are willing to take up a loss uh, to fulfill their partisan uh, behavior? So they kind of... Um, um, yeah, uh, so I'm wondering in that case, shouldn't one expect a de increase in default or a lowering of fund performance or maybe a, a lower, right, for, the, for the lenders, maybe a lower revenue, right? So that's, um, uh, although they also charge higher interest rates, so I'm wondering. Uh, but anyway, um, I'm not sure. Elizabeth or anybody else who wants to answer that, please? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Um, and I also want to thank Maria Sunta for, for a great discussion. And I find that point actually goes back to the point she also raised in the discussion, which is that we are ultimately comparing these two groups, one has a distance increase, one has a distance decrease, they're both partisan at the end of the day. 
Um, and so therefore, ex ante, it's really not clear whether we would predict any difference in performance exposed because we're essentially comparing two groups that are likely not objective. Uh, it could be that both are equally far off from the truth. It could be that one is a little bit closer to the objective truth than not. The fact that we don't really see at least statistically significant differences in performance suggests that you know, maybe one group is overestimating, the other one is underestimating, and, and the truth is somewhere in between. Um, something that we could do at least with the fund managers is, is try to look more at the unaffiliated um, uh, managers, although also there there's likely a lot of measurement error in there. So I'm not sure how uh, you know strong uh, yeah, of an emphasis I would place on these being the objective truth. Okay, thanks. But did you answer the question on the profits actually? Sorry, on the that they actually would, would uh, take into account the loss. These, yeah, uh, so I, I mean, we would. Yeah, so so yeah. relative to you know a rational, objective investor, absolutely. But here we're not really comparing a so, biased, you know, a partisan investor against an objective. Yeah, so that we would have to do the the uh, that's right. Yeah. That's yes, yes, yes. Okay, um, great. Thanks. Any final words before we break for five minutes still? No. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody, and uh, I'll see you again in. Uh, five minutes for the final paper for today. Thanks again for the discussion and the presentation.
Okay, it is 6 p.m. in London. Let's turn to our fourth paper, last one for today. Uh, we're turning now from cross-border to national, to France. Private credit under political influence, evidence from France. We've been talking a little bit about France already, so now we get more detail. Uh, Noemi will present the paper, and then uh, Pat uh, okay, will uh, uh, discuss the paper. Over to you, Noemi. Thanks. So let me share my slides. We can see it, we can hear you. Perfect, thank you. Well, thanks a lot um, to the organizers for including our paper on the program and, and thanks everyone for uh, attending the last session of the day. Uh, so uh, my name is Noemi Pinaron-Fati and this is joint work with Anne-Laure Delat from Paris-Dauphine and uh, Adrien Matre from Princeton University. And so the starting point of this paper is a market for bank loans to French local public entities whereby local public entities will refer uh, to local governments, but also other local public entities like public hospitals, public schools, public housing, etc. And this market is characterized by three features. First, it's large. It's roughly 170 billion euros, which amounts to 10% of French GDP. Second, this market is profitable for banks. And the reason is that a public sector entity debt benefits from an explicit government guarantee, so that the risk of those loans is basically the same as the risk on sovereign bonds. And yet these loans earn an average spread of 150 to 100 basis points over sovereign bonds, making them quite profitable for banks. And finally, and most importantly, this market is discretionarily allocated by politicians. And the reason is that loans to public entities are explicitly excluded from European Union public procurement rules. And as a result, uh, local politicians have a complete discretion over the allocation of these loans. And so these three features uh, that are actually not specific to France, but shared by a large number of developed countries, especially in Europe, make this market an ideal place for reciprocal favors between politicians and banks which is a precisely the topic of our paper. So the reciprocal favor scheme that we have in mind in this paper is the following. So first, and on the left-hand side of the chart, banks grant uh, politicians election favors, whereby they expand credit to private firms before elections in order uh, to improve the current economic prospects and boost the incumbents' re-election chances. But so the question is why would uh, private profit maximizing banks accept to ponder to local politicians' agenda? Well, in return, and that's the right-hand side of the chart, politicians reciprocate the favors by granting the banks who help them a preferential access to a politically controlled market, which is precisely this market for public entity loans. And so quite naturally, uh, our paper is divided into two parts. In a first part, we focus on the corporate credit market, and we ask, do private banks expand credit to firms before elections in order to benefit political incumbents? And then in a second part, we look at uh, the other side, the market for public entity debt, and we ask, do political incumbents reciprocate the favor when you elected by granting banks a preferential access to the market for local public entity loans? So that's the, the, the scheme and the plan for the paper. So we see this paper as a contributing to two uh, strands of the literature. First, we make a contribution um, to the literature on political credit cycles. So here, what the literature has shown is that politically connected banks, so either in the form of a personal political connections or banks that have a politician sitting on their boards, tend to exhibit a political credit cycle. And here, what we document is a political credit cycle for formally independent profit maximizing banks in the low corruption environments. And we should seem to be driven by this reciprocal favor scheme. Second, um, this paper also adds to the literature on the benefits of political connections, and in particular, benefits in form of preferential access to government contracts. And here, our contribution is to uncover a large unregulated market, which is the market for public entity loans and also to document an alternative mechanism, which is reciprocal favors 
instead of one-way favors driven by political conditions. So now, let's now delve a, a bit deeper in the actual empirical setup. So we look at France over 2006-2017. Uh, uh, Since we look at France, um, the politicians we look at are uh, members of parliaments, so MPs. MPs are uh, the most prominent local political figures in France. They are elected for five-year terms in 550 constituencies. And we collect data on uh, those MPs by looking at both election results and the large number of hand-collected political parliaments. And a key advantage of looking at France is that we can exploit the administrative credit registry from uh, Banque de France, which covers the universe of uh, credit to both private corporations and public entities, which, as you may have guessed, is really important in, in our setting. So we use uh, this data set at a quarterly frequency, and we match both private firms and uh, public entities to uh, legislative constituencies using the geographical identifier of the board. So to provide you with a bit more details on these loans to uh, local public entities, so the first thing to realize is that this is really large. It's really the main financing source for um, French local governments and other local public entities, more than 80% of our total debt. Um, and importantly, this heavy reliance on the bank financing as opposed to bonds uh, is really the norm in Europe. Here in the US with a lot of municipal bonds is a bit of, a, of an outlier. So really having a, a lot of bank financing is the norm in Europe. Second, when you, we look at the, the type of public entities that borrow, so most of them are actual local governments. The second largest category is public hospitals, and then you would have all the others, so public housing, local branches of central government agencies, etc. But really the largest is local governments. Very importantly, uh, for what we do and, and what we want to investigate, these loans are excluded from EU public procurement rules. And so the reason that was stated by the EU lawmaker is that basically when uh, dealing with uh, financial markets, it had to be that a public entity had um, the ability to react very quickly in order to uh, potentially benefit from uh, advantageous market conditions. And they thought it was uh, incompatible with having often a uh, heavy and time consuming public procurement rules. And as a result, this whole market is excluded from the EU public procurement rules, which gives politicians a complete uh, discretion over the allocation of these loans. The constraints that they have is on total borrowing. So the rules on a subnational uh, borrowing, subnational entities borrowing in France are that uh, loans can only be used to finance investment expenditures as opposed to current expenditures and the interests on these loans must be financed using own resources as opposed to issuing from their loans. And so implicitly, there's basically a, a ceiling on total debt, but no rules on the allocation. And finally, so I was mentioning, we observe a significant spread over a sovereign bonds, indicating that this market is quite profitable. And so we've been trying to think about explanations. So for instance, one potential explanation could be that uh, the regulatory risk weight of these loans uh, is 20% as opposed to a 0% for sovereign bonds. Uh, but even doing uh, a very conservative estimation of uh, the implied additional cost of equity um, implying for uh, holding these loans, we find something um, of the order of magnitude of 15 basis points, which is like 10 times lower than the spread we actually observe. So it seems to be that um, really this market is uh, quite attractive and has abnormal profits for banks. Okay, so let's now turn um, to the first part of the paper, do banks grant election favors to politicians? So here to investigate this aspect, we rely on predictions from a simple a quid pro quo framework of a reciprocal exchange of favors between a politician and a bank. And in such a framework, what happens is that banks grant election favors that is, they accept to distort their uh, corporate credit decisions only to obtain economic favors in return, only to get a preferential access to the market for public entity loans. And so what that means is that we should observe election favors only when the incumbent is influential enough 
to actually significantly affect the allocation of public entity loans. And so here we lose a, a bunch of politicians' characteristics that we summarize uh, in a dummy that we call powerful MP, and I will detail these characteristics in a, in a few minutes. Second, in this setting, uh, asking for favors is costly because they must be reciprocated. And as a result, politicians ask election favors only when they are most valuable. This is the case as the next election approaches, since we know voters are quite myopic. So this is a dummy that we call election year. And this is also the case when uh, the next election is more contested for the incumbent, which is a dummy that we call contested. And so we end up with this specification where on the left-hand side, you have a corporate credit in constituency C at time T. And on the right-hand side, we have the triple interaction election year times contested times powerful MP. And our prediction is that the beta coefficient is positive. That is, banks expand corporate credit volumes when election approaches, all the more so in contested constituencies held by influential politicians. So to be more precise on the variables definitions, so election year is a dummy equal to one if there's a parliamentary election taking place this year. We also account for the fact that 25% of MPs are also mayors, usually of the largest city in their constituency. And so for those MPs, we also take the municipal election cycle into account. As for the contested dummy, it's a dummy equal to one if the upcoming election is close race or if the constituency is not a stronghold for the incumbent party, that is the constituency was held by the other party before the incumbent election. And uh, finally, for uh, the powerful MP dummy, so here what we want to capture is the ability of a politician to uh, affect the allocation decision of a large quantity of public entity loans. And so we capture this with two dimensions. First, the fact that the um, politician is prominent in his own party, and this matters because it means that other local politicians are going to seek um, her endorsement. Party endorsement is really important for local elections in France. And second, we want to have politicians that have a lot of direct connections with other local politicians. So basically MPs that can influence the debt decisions of a lot of mayors in their constituency, hospital directors, et cetera. So we use these two dimensions to define uh, the powerful MP. Then. We've of course tested uh, that our results don't depend on uh, the very specific way in which we define those variables. As a result, we end up with a, a number of constituencies that we flag as uh, being held by a powerful politicians facing constituent elections for each election cycle. Uh, and as you can see on, on these maps, these constituencies are not located uh, only in one area. France they also tend to, to change from one election to the next, and uh, they do not tend to be all right wing or all uh, left wing. So here, um, red is left and uh, right is blue, as uh, opposed to what you have in the US. So let's look at the, the first set of results. So first, we run our specification with only the interaction between election year and the contested dummy. And we find basically no effect, which in a sense is a reassuring from an identification point of view, because it shows that basically uh, contested and non-contested constituencies are not on a different uh, macro path. Now looking at um, the interaction of interest with the powerful MP dummy, we find a coefficient that is a positive and significant, and so what uh, that means is that private banks expand corporate credit in election years only if the incumbent is contested and powerful. And the effect is actually uh, quantitatively large because we find that credit volumes are around 9% higher in uh, election years in contested constituencies held by influential politicians compared to similarly contested constituencies but not held by influential politicians. So this is quantitatively significant. So these results go into the right direction, but there's still an important issue, which is that uh, these effects could be driven by constituency level credit demand shocks. So for instance, if in election years, influential politicians facing contested elections manage to implement demand side policies, 
say, tax cuts in order to uh, boost the current economic outlook and improve their re-election chances. If these policies are specific to election years, contested constituencies, and influential politicians, they would likely be correlated to a positive credit demand shocks that would induce an upward bias in our coefficient of interest. So that's an issue for our identification. Here, what we do uh, to circumvent this issue is that we rely on a unique prediction of the reciprocal favor story, which is that only the banks that highly value the economic favor should engage in the election favor. That is, we should observe the increase uh, in corporate credit in election years only for banks at highly value getting an improved access to the market for public entity loans. On the other hand, the credit demand story predicts an increase in corporate credit that is uniform at all banks. And so we can uh, try to use variation in banks valuation of the economic favor to help us disentangle um, these two competing stories. So first, and in a sense, hopefully for us, there does seem to be variation in a bank's willingness or ability to access the public entity debt market. So looking across banks, only 25% of banks take part in this market. And uh, this is mostly related to banks' uh, sort of time invariant characteristics. The banks that are active in these markets are the largest banks with a typically very large uh, geographical footprint. Local politicians tend to rely mostly on French banks and also mostly on uh, cooperative banks that are characterized by a decentralized decision structure. So there does seem to be variation in banks' uh, interest in having a further uh, better access to this market. And so here what we do is that we basically proxy for banks' evaluation of the economic favor by using banks' actual participation in the market for public entity loans. That's a form of a revealed preference argument in a sense. And so we end up with a, a dummy that we call involved bank that is equal to one if a bank has public entity loans in its balance sheet. And so with that in hand, we basically rerun our main specification, further interacted with the involved bank dummy. And so what that says is that we expect to have an increase in corporate credit in election years for contested constituencies held by influential politicians, but more so from banks that have something to gain from this election favor, that is banks that are uh, interesting in having a preferential access to the market for public entity loans. So importantly, um, this specification allows us to include uh, highly granular fixed effects, and in particular, constituency time fixed effects that can control precisely for this uh, time varying constituency level, for instance, dimensions. We also have bank type times uh, time fixed effects to control for the fact that uh, the banks who lend to um, local public entities may be subject to different time varying shocks. And we have bank type times a uh, constituency fixed effects that basically control for bank type times constituency matching patterns. And so here first, uh, we rerun our baseline specification on a sample that is splitted along this involved bank dummy. And what we find is that the political credit cycle that we document is entirely driven by involved banks. We see basically a, a well-defined zero for a non-involved banks. Running this again on uh, the full sample, we find a, a point estimate that is very similar. And we include uh, these bank Type times time and constituency time times six effects and show that our results are robust to uh, these more demanding specifications. So here, what that shows um, is that we document that uh, private profit maximizing banks seem um, to be willing to ponder to local politicians' agenda, but only the banks that are active in the market for public entity debt do so. So we then try to see where does this politically driven credit go. And so looking across industry characteristics, we find that uh, this politically driven credit mostly goes to industries with uh, short-term financing needs, proxied with high working capital oversales 
or high interest payments over value added, and to industries in economic decline, proxied with low value added over assets and high probability of bankruptcy. So we interpret this as uh, the fact that this politically driven credit is mostly directed towards uh, avoiding salient bankruptcies in election years that would be detrimental to the incumbents' re-election prospects. But at the same time, they may deter uh, reallocation of resources towards most productive firms, pointing towards uh, an effect on credit misallocation. We also do a, a few tests to rule out uh, the most obvious alternative stories. So the first um, alternative story that, that, that we thought about is that it may be that banks holding public entity debt on their balance sheets are also more likely to have uh, politicians sitting on their boards. And in this sense, the reciprocal favors hypothesis would just be exactly the same as the political connections hypothesis. So here, what we've done is that we've uh, extracted the composition of the board of all the main banks holding public entity loans on their balance sheet. And we compare that list of names with the list of mayors and MPs that we have. And out of more than 1,500 names, we find only one MP and six mayors. So we don't think that this is um, the main driver of the phenomenon that we document. Another alternative story would be that uh, banks holding public entity debt on their balance sheet are more likely to lend to firms executing government contracts. So here's the story would be that uh, these politicians they try to implement demand side policies. These, politi these demand side policies lead to more government contracts. And if the firms executing these government contracts borrow from the banks that lend um, to local public entities, we would have a demand shock, but that is specific to these involved banks. And as a result, we would still um, have this upward bias in our coefficient of interest driven by a demand side policies instead of the reciprocal favor story. So here's the first thing that we note is that uh, except for these uh, public entity loans, the French public procurement uh, code is actually quite strict. Uh, as in other matters, it follows EU standards. And so very often winning firms are not in the same constituency uh, as the public entity. But still, in order to make sure that this is not what is driving our results, what we do is that we exclude uh, sectors that are mostly reliant on public procurement contracts. So we collect data on this and we uh, exclude basically the top uh, five sectors in terms of their share of uh, government contracts in total value added. And we find that the results are uh, exactly similar. OK, so let's now turn. Um, to the other side of the story, which is a bank's reward and the market for public entity loans. So here the question is, how are banks rewarded when taking part in the re-election effort of an incumbent? What do they get in return? And the main uh, methodological issue is that it's not clear how to measure banks' involvement in the re-election effort of an incumbent in an agnostic way, because this is not directly observed. So here, what we do is that we proceed in two steps. In the first step, what we do is that we take the residual of corporate credits after filtering out bank times constituency fixed effects. And so what that tells is that in every period, it gives us basically the abnormal supply of credits in a bank in a given constituency relative to the mean bank behavior in this constituency. And we then take this measure and rank banks along this measure in the year of the election. And so what this yields is the involvement of a bank, so the involvement in terms of the abnormal corporate credit supply in this constituency, relative to other banks in the constituency in the year of the election. And so we have this favor that we call favor BCT that we interpret as the size. So this is basically a volume in terms of corporate credit, the size of the favor granted by uh, bank B to the incumbent in constituency C at an uh, election taking place in New York T. And so what we want to ask is, does the size of the favor predict an improved access to the market for public entity loans after the election? So here, what we do is that we take uh, this favor variable in our uh, next specification, where on the left-hand side, we have 
the increase in credit to public entities by bank B in constituency C between election year T and two years later, where two is equal to two or four. And on the right-hand side, we have the favor variable, so the size of the favor, which we interact with our contested dummy, because favors matter uh, only when the election is contested, with the poor full MP dummy, because favors can be reciprocated only when the MP is influential enough. And very importantly, we need to interact with this effect with a re-elected dummy, because favors can be reciprocated only when the incumbent is actually re-elected. Importantly, in this specification, we have constituency times election fixed effects. And so what that means is that we compare for a given uh, constituency and a given election, whether the banks that granted a larger favor to the incumbent receive a larger reward in terms of an improved access to the market for public entity votes. So basically, with these fixed effects, the effects that we document can be interpreted as a changes in market shares of different banks uh, in a constituency after the election. Five minutes, please, maybe. Yes. So what we find, uh, and yeah, that's more than enough. So what we find is that the banks granted larger election favors are indeed rewarded when the incumbent is re-elected. So we have a positive relationships within constituency times election between the size of the favor and the uh, growth rate of public entity loans in the two years and four years after the election. And uh, importantly, this is true only if the incumbent is re-elected. If the incumbent is not re-elected, we instead find a negative uh, coefficient. And what that says is that the newly elected politician is basically going to punish the banks that helped most um, the previous MP which is really in line with our reciprocal favors, a quid pro quo story. So to further make sure that we only capture that we want, we exploit a, a distinction, which is that you have local entities that are controlled by local politicians. So this would be local governments, or for instance, public housing, which in France is controlled by local governments. But you also have local entities controlled by central government politicians. So those are the local branches of central government agencies, or for instance, in France, universities directly depend uh, from the education ministry in the central governments. And our prediction is that we should see our reciprocal favors pattern only for local entities controlled by local politicians. And so looking at this test where we split local entities um, along by whom they are controlled, we find our pattern only for local entities controlled by local politicians, we find basically nothing for local entities controlled by central politicians, which again is in line with obstacle. So to summarize, in this paper, we document a political credit cycle for a formally independent private profit maximizing banks. And we show evidence consistent with the fact that uh, this political credit cycle is driven by a reciprocal favors scheme, whereby politicians trade election favors against an improved access to the market for public entity loans. This is socially costly. It leads to a suboptimal allocation of corporate credit, which in the long run may impede growth. And it sustains higher borrowing costs for public entities, which in the end is detrimental to taxpayers. And so what this shows is that uh, the existence of this politically controlled rent, which is due to the exclusion of this market for public procurement rules, has a detrimental economic effects, which calls for an increased transparency on the allocation of public entity loans, and in general, further scrutiny on any market that is excluded from public procurement rules. A second takeaway is that uh, it's important to look beyond uh, banks' formal independence and in particular, at whether, uh, where this type of schemes could be occurring in order to get a better sense of the actual influence of banks in politics. Thank you. And I think I'm right on time. Yes, you are indeed. Thank you so much. Um, over to you, Pat. Great. Oh, 
All right. Um, so thank you for inviting me to discuss this paper. Um, it has been a pleasure to uh, to read it. And so very briefly, Noemi did a fantastic job summarizing it. Uh, and so I'm just going to very quickly highlight that the authors examine uh, the potential for political interference in both private lending markets and the market for uh, public entity debt in, in France. And so uh, in sort of two bullet points, they find that more credit is granted to the private sector when an important politician is in an uncertain race. And this credit flows to inefficient industries. Uh, they then find that uh, banks have, banks that sort of have observably higher lending seem to subsequently have better access to public debt, but only if the, the incumbent uh, is reelected. And so I think this is sort of a very compelling uh, narrative. And I think this is, uh, you know, it highlights uh, that we can, in fact, in some cases, find quid pro quo, right? And so um, some of what I'm gonna talk about very quickly and what I like about this paper is we found out recently it can be very difficult to document evidence of uh, quid, quo, uh, quid pro quo relationships. And it would seem that the authors have uh, found evidence of it in, in France. And so maybe we shouldn't have been looking in Ukraine. We just needed to, uh, to look to France. Um, but this sort of brings me this, the same problem of identifying potential quid pro quo has uh, plagued the literature for, uh, for, for since, it's, since its inception. And so there are sort of two sides of this literature. The first shows um, the benefits to firms of being politically connected. So three of many channels um, of which I'm citing a subset of uh, the research on this have focused on things like access uh, to bailouts, favorable procurement uh, access and terms, uh, regulatory forbearance, a separate side of the literature has shown the cost of uh, political connections, right? So two of the, again, uh, uh, two of potentially many channels are increased employment, increased support in uh, a variety of, 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 of facets. And so I think that this paper um, is one of the few that's able to show both sides of this relationship in what I think is a very clever uh, manner. And so I, I would like to say that sort of overall, I think this is paper that does a careful analysis and makes a very strong case for both the quid and the quo. And uh, with this said, I, I have a few thoughts on maybe how the authors can dig in a little bit more. In particular, I'm going to focus on a few alternative supply uh, demand side stories that uh, came to mind when, when reading this. Um, but overall, I want people to, to sort of take away that my view on this is that uh, there are very few papers that are able to show both sides of this relationship in uh, such a concise and I think convincing way. Um, and so the, the channel primarily focuses on an increased supply of credit to, to, to firms. And so the first demand related story that uh, comes to mind is an uncertainty story. And so while the authors do have uh, some tests and I, and I don't mean to, the authors have thought about this, uh, there are many possible effects of uh, uncertainty. And so there are a variety of studies that have shown that elections, in particular close elections, increase uncertainty, particularly related to economic policy. And this can have a diverse set of consequences on economic activity. We can think about this on the firm side. Uh, there's evidence of investment changes. There's evidence not only of level effects, but compositional changes in which types of investments are pursued. But also there's evidence that economic uncertainty affects households, portfolio and spending decisions. And so now, depending on how banks allocate capital, differences in consumers borrowing behaviors could have spillover effects on money that is used to fund corporate investments. And so my, my first sort of question on this is, does the composition of loans or the opportunity set of banks change in a way that's not only about corporate levels? Do banks maybe have fewer profitable projects to invest in? And does the, 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 the marginal rate of return for different types of capital change in such a way that could potentially lead to uh, more credit being given to, to firms? And so, how, so some thoughts on how they might tackle this would actually be to sort of take, first take a step back and to look at uh, potential changes uh, in other outcome variables around the credit cycle. And so I would be curious for the authors to look a little bit more, more precisely at whether investment or employment 
generally varies with elections. So we can think about cuts on elections versus non-elections, close versus not close. Um, do mortgage applications change? Do real estate prices change? Again, thinking about different margins that could directly affect households. And sort of independent of uh, this demand side story, I think that this would be independently useful to examine the identifying assumptions of the main analysis maybe more concretely. Um, so again, the authors, I think, have very convincing tests on this winner-loser idea, in particular on access to credit. Uh, and I don't think that, that their effects are entirely demand-driven. Um, but looking at the scope for other types of demand stories would be helpful to, um, to, to, to pin down magnitudes. And sort of one, perhaps a bit of a cheap shot, is uh, they do have comparisons of banks that do or do not have public debt. This is helpful. But the literature has, has proposed that firms of different type or of different size have a different baseline exposure to uncertainty. And so to the extent that there, there are other things going on that affect corporate policies or bank policies, these could be correlated with the decision to access these markets and could also indicate a differential sensitivity to an uncertainty environment. And so uh, this would be, you know, again, these, these are helpful, but I think the authors can do a little bit more. Um, so the second demand type story is very specific to the French context and uh, also contingent on some existing literature. And so we know from a paper by Bertrand and, and co-authors that the same setting has been shown to induce changes in corporate behavior. In particular, um, sort of a, the, the seminal paper that, that's looked at this question in, in France has shown that educational ties between politicians and uh, firms lead to electoral cycle effects and cause firms to prop up their employment and their investment and lead to lower profitability. And so one question that immediately came to mind is, are these firms that are borrowing more financing uh, these changed real policies by increased bank debt? And so given that, that this literature has shown that there are, uh, these are bad investments or these are less profitable firms, this would also be consistent with some of the cross-sectional results. Now, so I would suggest the authors um, sort of exclude or separately estimate loans made to uh, connected firms. And I think that either results in, in sort of either sample or both subsamples would add an interesting context to the current results, right? So to what extent is there this pure mapping of uh, political incentives in both the corporate market and the investment market? But again, we can think about this again as a change in the types of loans that are being asked for. Um, and so this sort of brings me to, to my next comment, which uh, relates to the links between banks and politicians. And so the authors have collected substantial information about um, board members. And so my thought was, well, do banks that share educational ties uh, disproportionately respond? Um, and so this sort of harkens back to a literature looking on looking at the, the, the role of directors, uh, political connections, um, including uh, the paper presented today, in fact. Um, but one thought I had here is that uh, if connected banks are differentially changing their behavior, it would suggest a specific quid pro quo mechanism that Bertrand et al. do not find evidence of in, in their paper. And uh, so that would sort of suggest that the case for quid pro quo depends on either the type of firm or potentially if they don't find effects in those firms, the type of uh, the, the lack of relationship between uh, managers and, and politicians. And so I think that this could, again, provide a lot of context to color in the results and provide um, an even more nuanced picture. Um, so my last sort of set of comments is thinking at sort of a higher level, who's better off? Right? And so there seem to be several countervailing forces. So on the one hand, banks are making loans that are riskier. They're probably lower quality. It is unclear how that's going to affect profitability because it could be that banks are capable of responding by recontracting along interest rates. And that's not something the authors have had a chance to dig into. Um, but at the same time, they also get access to a lucrative segment of the, econ uh, of the economy, right? And so I'd like the authors to push a little bit further and to, to examine the net effect on bank profitability. And then coming back to this idea of reciprocality, is there an effect on incumbents? Are they more likely to, to be reelected? Uh, in particular, can you use this, and this might be asking too much of the data, but could you use this to estimate the uh, credit 
to vote elasticity, right? And so can you really sort of push this one step further and say, by how much do we need to expand bank lending to push a politician one point further? And again, I think that's potentially asking a bit much, but that would really, I think, sort of cap off this, this quid and quo type side of uh, this relationship. And so let me just uh, conclude by saying that the authors provide very convincing evidence of an exchange of favors between banks and politicians. They test a variety of ex post and ex ante out outcomes that help to rule out most alternative uh, interpretations. And I think what's, what's sort of left is to tighten the interpretation and uh, maybe to provide some, some policy implications. And uh, so I wish the authors the best of luck with the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, uh, let me, so maybe Noemi, I'll first turn over to you, but let me just mention that one of the points that uh, Pat just mentioned also came up in the Q&A box uh, uh, by uh, Pus Bamri. Um, a little bit uh, more about the strategy, whether it plays out with the voters, um, if politicians are boosting private credit to up their election chances, are the voters seeing this and can attribute and can you attribute uh, the higher credits uh, to the incumbent and can they the voters sorry attribute uh, higher credits to the incumbent politician so it goes a bit along the lines of what Pat just mentioned it's kind of a um, uh, uh, credit vote uh, elasticity or voter credit elasticity great yeah so well first uh, thanks a lot Pat uh, those are all super super insightful comments that are going to help us a lot moving forward um, with, with the paper just maybe a, a few points. So first on the alternative uh, demand side stories. So I completely agree that uh, all of these channels um, are important. I think as uh, far as our identification strategy is concerned, what matters is whether these demand stories have differential implications for banks that lend or do not lend to public entities. And uh, so here's so one of the, the connected firms, so the Bertrand et Al paper, Hence, uh, there is no specific reason why those connected firms would be specifically borrowing from uh, these banks. As for the uncertainty stories, uh, I think the, the point is super well taken. We know that these banks are different. They have different characteristics. And we know that uh, reaction to uncertainty also differs as a function of these baseline characteristics. So I think that's a really good point. And I think it is actually testable. We could test whether uh, these banks um, have a differential reaction to a different type of uncertainty shocks that are not uh, uncertainty shocks stemming from uh, local elections, but maybe some more like macro uncertainty shocks. I mean, I think this is something that is uh, actually testable. So I think this is, this is super nice and to definitely tighten uh, the, the identification. As for the, the banks and the politicians' networks, so um, do we also observe that these banks, for instance, have educational ties um, to politicians. So here, there are unfortunately a lot of things that we cannot do because uh, we work with anonymized data from the credit registry. So we cannot uh, really identify uh, neither banks nor firms. So I think what we want to say here is that um, we cannot formally exclude that there are uh, social networks effects going on. And in the end, these banks and politicians they are repeatedly interacting. So they may even become friends by interacting in a sense. I think what we want to say is that we provide a sufficient explanation, that the fact that we have this reciprocal exchange of favor is sufficient to explain uh, the patterns that we're observing the data and this political credit cycle for private profit maximizing banks. I think we cannot claim that we formally exclude any social network type of explanations. And uh, so, so on, on the, the last points, on the who, who, who's better off, and in a sense, a cost-benefit analysis. So we are precisely trying to, to go there. We've obtained data on uh, loan terms, so interest rates of uh, these loans that are granted to private firms. So we're going to be able to test whether um, these loan terms also differ. And precisely, we would like to get a sense of, uh, of well, the, the cost-benefit analysis that, that these banks are um, doing. And so finally, to answer both Pat and the question in, in the Q&A, we're also uh, trying to work on uh, this effect on the re-election probability. Here, the issue is that in a sense, we uh, instrument additional credit with a dummy that is contested. That is, we say that there is more credit precisely when the election is contested. And so it's not completely obvious uh, to then look at uh, whether having more credit because your election is contested, how does it make a difference in your actual election probability? So we thought a lot about this and we think we could 
well, actually control for the contested dummy and see whether controlling for that the instrumented increase in credit uh, matters. But uh, just to say that the reason why we've not done it so far is that because it's, it's not a completely trivial given, uh, given our setting. But again, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for those comments. Uh, really, really well taken. And, uh, and it's going to help us a lot in the, in the next steps. And I'm happy to take, I haven't opened, sorry, I don't, haven't opened the case so far, but I'm happy to. Um, so I guess the last the last issue is really like a chicken egg problem, right? You're using the contestability uh, to identify where the credit should go, and then you would have to use it also to uh, the, uh, the, the the credit actually or to see the election outcome. I guess if you can maybe use the past election uh, as some kind of instrument or so, that might be maybe help this. Um, so Orkin has his uh, virtual hand up here, and I think he maybe wants to bring in his experience with uh, Turkish data. Could that be? Thanks, Arsene. Yeah, uh, I mean, I was going to point out uh, something from the literature, actually, which your paper deviates and it's super interesting, right, just to focus on the private banks. But most of the well, most of this literature has actually done the identification by just comparing state versus private firms. And there, you know, this straightforward contestedness or competitiveness of the election works quite well, because on one side, you have the state banks who are not necessarily optimizing agents, right? They're just you can think of them as you know internalizing the cost of politics, right? So they're the tool for the for the government or for the incumbent politician. And then there there are the optimizing agents, which are private banks. So by comparing the two, you get you get a you get a good understanding of how you know that political cost might you know might show up. Uh, but in the private setting, I'm thinking of like using again the co competitiveness or contestedness, which is which seems to be key in your setting, both for the first set of outcomes and also the for the for the for the later the favor uh, related outcomes uh, i'm thinking of from the bank's perspective as well if i'm a private bank okay i understand again the the politicians incentives are quite similar to the to the previous setting as you know where you would compare state versus private but if i'm a private bank and there is a contested election that also increases my chances of losing out my bet right so the, the more motivated the politician is, the less motivated I am actually at, in terms of like providing more credit to, to that region. So uh, that, that doesn't seem to be showing up anywhere in your setting as a concern uh, because like it basically implies the opposite impact that, uh, that you found, right? How, I was wondering like if there was a way to kind of basically take out that contestedness side of it and then still kind of show some suggestive evidence independent of it or maybe you know like, what would you think in general if you have a solution yeah i think the the, the part of the answer so, so i first i completely agree with the, the facts that you are stating uh, i think part of the answer is that we are interacted uh contested with uh, another variable that is the influential dummy and so we're taking out the baseline effect of having a, a contested election in an election year and so this baseline effect may be negative because, as you said, it may be that banks are uh, on average less willing to help politicians if they think that the favor is not going to be returned because the election is contested. So I think really here what makes the difference is that taking uh, that effect into account, we look at the incremental effect of helping an incumbent that is actually uh, super influential on this market for public entity loans, and that can return the favor. And we find that the difference is positive. In a sense, all that we measure is relative. Uh, it may be that even um, that additional effect gives us uh, a negative in total, but it's less negative than just having a the election. So I think here really the, the relative part uh, is, is important to understand uh, how what we show is uh, compatible with the intuition that you just gave. I think I think what what I might suggest, like uh, from my perspective, the easiest way maybe to check this could be, for instance, to partition that contestedness into two parts, where you know the the uh, the politician might be very close to you know either losing or or winning, or you know relatively close but not that close. So like maybe like creating a category there. Uh, and then maybe there might even be a nonlinear impact between those two categories, and checking that might, you know, maybe e either give even more flavor to the to the setting. Okay. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I you. think uh, that that is doable, and that's a great suggestion. Thank you very much. Uh, last question of today, Kokan, please. Hi. So um, 
this is super interesting and, and I like it a lot. So I just have um, a bit of a question at the end when you mentioned about the, um, let me call it the social desirability of, of this phenomenon. Um, and I think it, it rhymes with a lot of this big literature on favoritism and uh, sort of quid pro quo or power politics in which um, it's, you know, it's one thing to show that there's some, some deals probably going on, uh, you know, in terms of favoritism, but I wonder if you could, or maybe I've missed it during the talk, but I wonder if you could really pin down that this is clearly socially undesirable. So, um, well, if, if we think of politics in part as um, playing the role of redistributing a little bit, um, then, then, you know, or, or maybe just quantify to what extent we can say that this is like really, really costly and it's like, you know, not the, not even the second best, uh, but even like, you know, worse, much worse than what could be done if the politician had just redistributed, you know, openly. Sure, I think that that's a great question. And I think we don't definitely don't have a, a definitive answer on the sort of welfare statement. I think so there are two distortions that uh, the paper is highlighting. The first is a distortion on the corporate credit market. And so here, in a sense, your question is, well, maybe it's socially desirable to finance those firms. So here, I think two, two aspects are important. So first, we show that these firms have a characteristics that they are basically uh, declining firms. Uh, so it's, I mean, you, you can always argue that it's also uh, good to finance this firm, but in a sense, uh, it points towards uh, misallocation. The other uh, interesting thing that I have not mentioned is that we find that this credit is mostly short credit. Um, so really, this is credit to keep the firms afloat uh, the year of the election but it doesn't seem that it's financing long-term projects because it's credit with a maturity lower than one year. So there really seems to be something with a, for a short period of time trying to keep afloat firms, but it's unclear that it actually fuels um, long-run growth. So that's for the corporate credit side. On the um, public entity uh, loan market side, so I think here the main uh, potentially undesirable uh, social outcome is that this is sustaining higher borrowing costs public entities. Uh, and here we're really uh, playing with something which is that uh, voters are usually not so well informed about the borrowing costs of uh, their local governments. And uh, so here it's really something that politicians can extract in a sense they don't pay the reputation cost for these higher uh, borrowing costs. And so I, I think that here it's hard to argue um, that this is socially desirable. That said, um, we don't have uh, really a, a framework to uh, quantify both of these effects to put it all uh, under uh, a welfare number that we can look at. So, so I agree, it's, it's a bit of an overstatement that we can really say it's socially undesirable. Um, we have evidence pointing uh, into that direction. I think that's, that's the message. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, normally when we when sessions run too long, it's because the presenter took too much time or the discussion took too much time. Here, the uh, floor discussion took too much time, which I'm very happy about. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for this uh, the great presentation, good discussions, and lively, um, lively conversations. Um, we're going to take a break now for 19 hours and seven minutes. Uh, we're going to be back tomorrow at uh, 2 p.m. sharp, uh, London time. And um, looking forward to another exciting day. I think we're going to start with uh, polarization uh, tomorrow at two o'clock, two papers on pol polarization. And uh, I wish everybody a good evening or a good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you and see you tomorrow. <laughs>